like to call this uh, uh, Global Placeless Symposium to a, to a start. And uh, I wanna notify everyone that we plan to record this event. Um, again, not to record in perpetuity, but so that some people who are on time zones that could not stretch to make it here live can still take part. And uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you here for today's webinar um, on, on the topic of making space for social medicine, uh, looking at different ways of building space in medical education for the field of social medicine. Um, my name is Jeremy Green. I'm an internist. I kind of rushed here from clinic into my uh, you know, sweltering attic here in, in, a, in a ridiculously warm Baltimore. I'm an internist at Johns Hopkins, where I also direct the Department of the History of Medicine and a Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine. And it's really such a pleasure as we work, uh, you know, I and many colleagues from several different social science and humanities disciplines at Johns Hopkins work to build space for the social sciences, the social world, the social context as a fundamental aspect of not only basic sciences of clinical education, but, um, but developmental clinical skills in clinical education as well. Um, I've learned so much by being in conversation with other colleagues around the country here in the United States, some of whom are here and around the world, for each of us face different opportunities and different constraints in, in insisting that medicine cannot be taught outside of social context and that this vibrant field of social medicine is essential. For some of you, social medicine comes across as something so essential it's, it, it barely needs talking about. Um, for many of us, uh, we operate in a context where we say the phrase social medicine and are met with, uh, if not a blank stare, at least the need for further elaboration of what this field is. So we have, we have representatives from all uh, continents today, I think, uh, with the exception of Antarctica. Um, and really you want to hear from them and not from me. I'll just apologize again that I'm in an attic, uh, which is going through rolling brownouts um, and inadequate air conditioning. Um, and, uh, and so at times you may not be able to see me or I may lose connection. Um, but we, we are, our plan for today is to have each panelist speak for about 10 to 12 minutes about what social medicine is in medical education at their institution. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? What, um, what creative means of creating space have, have uh, taken place? Um, and then once all the panelists have introduced themselves um, and their programs, we are going to have space for a, um, for a, a set of a, a moderated discussion among the panelists. We'll have a bit of a break first and then open it up to a Q&A for everybody. But after each presentation, if there are specific clarifications that any of you have for a speaker, please put them in the Q&A and we'll make space for them uh, to the extent that we can. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce, um, well, I'll, I'll allow uh, the first panelist to introduce um, themselves. And that's uh, David Jones from Harvard Medical School, Harvard University. Okay, I, I think that's working. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to have an audience uh, for this event and I look forward to learning uh, as much from all of you as I will from my fellow panelists uh, at this event. <clears throat> as Jeremy said, I'm on the faculty uh, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I used to collaborate uh, quite closely with Jeremy before uh, he helped headed off to the sweltering tropics of Baltimore. <clears throat> uh, and so what, I'll, what I will do is I will give you an overview of how the social medicine curriculum has developed uh, at Harvard over many years. And I hope to come in below my budgeted 12 minutes. And so we'll have time to take questions before moving on to the next speaker. So social medicine has had a long presence at Harvard Medical School. You could, you could bicker about some of the terminology here, but if you look at the substance of our concerns, you can trace the antecedents back to the 19th century, uh, when the medical school began offering training on hygiene. And if you look at what was actually taught, it was largely about tuberculosis, sanitation, and diseases of poverty, uh, which have become enduring concerns for practitioners of social medicine, even into the 21st century. And over the decades that followed, social medicine concepts appeared in various forms, but were not a consistent presence in the curriculum. Sometimes there was someone in the faculty who were teaching recognizably social medicine-like courses, but sometimes not. Um, 
the first lecture that explicitly had social medicine in the title was at least as early as 1945, but there might have been earlier ones. And then more recently, in 1987, Harvard Medical School implemented a formal, a formal social medicine requirement for all of its students. But in that first iteration of the requirement, many of the courses that could fulfill the social medicine requirement were not actually <clears throat> social medicine. They were courses in ethics or health policy, even literature, law, or religion. And it was really only in 2006 that a curriculum reform created a recognizable course in social medicine uh, alongside required courses on ethics, health policy, and clinical epidemiology. And so there was this 10-year stretch from 2006 to 2015 when there were these four required courses uh, that occurred uh, in series over the first uh, year and a half of the curriculum. And then in 2015, we adopted what is now the current curriculum in which these four social science courses were integrated into a two-month required sequence, which we've titled Essentials of the Profession 1 and 2. And so the social medicine course is one-fourth of this broader social science sequence. Now, it's hard to prove this, but I think this may be the largest social science requirement at a North American medical school. Uh, we have two months, 100% full-time of the students' attention over their four years in medical school. <clears throat> but if you look at the curriculum map, it's still very easy to miss the presence of this course, Essentials of the Profession. Uh, it's a required part of the curriculum. It's terrific that we have two months. Um, but I think it'd be a very small number of students who would say that they considered this to be the most important thing that they learned at Harvard Medical School. That, of course, is our ambition, and we're making progress there. Uh, but a lot of the students do understand that their primary mission is to learn how the heart works, how the lungs work. And so we have to continuously make the case that the material we cover in social medicine really is as important for them. And since it's a full-time course for these two months, it is great that we have 100% of the students' attention uh, while we have them. But again, that attention is divided amongst social medicine, health policy, and ethics. And I'm sure that there are some students who complete the course who are unsure of exactly what social medicine is, uh, and I think that happens because they haven't looked carefully enough at the course materials. Now, the course itself uh, is required for all of the medical and dental students at the medical school. And so we have about 200 students in the classroom each January. And the social medicine faculty, in parallel with the ethics faculty, have decided that this content is best taught through small group tutorials. So we have a group of 10 or 11 students uh, who are assigned to a faculty member, and they meet uh, for 10 sessions, 10 two-hour sessions over the course of the month for the social medicine requirement. <clears throat> and if you can do the math, you can see that requires a lot of faculty. Uh, so that as the course runs, we have 19 small group tutorials. Ideally, that would mean we would have 19 faculty, uh, but it's hard for us to, to get faculty to commit to being present at every session. So we often have a lot of faculty pair, so a pair of faculty who, between the two of them, will cover every session. And so that means each January when we teach the course, we usually have somewhere between 30 and 35 social medicine faculty involved uh, in this course. Most of these people are not actual professors of social medicine at the medical school. Most of them are pract practitioners of clinical medicine. We have people from pediatrics, psychiatry, emergency medicine, internal medicine, hospitalists. Uh, who self-identify as people who are doing social medicine-informed clinical work, and that's the pool of people we draw on to teach this course. So as I said, we have 10 sessions. Uh, for each of these sessions, we're allowed to, to require the students to do about two hours of reading and preparation. Uh, the course has a midterm and a final exam, and a lot of the students are fully engaged and well-prepared and learn a lot from this course. But not everyone. The medical school relies on pass-fail grading. Uh, the students suspect that it'd be very hard to fail this course. Uh, and so each year, there are some who see how far they can push us uh, and still manage to pass. Now, what actually is social medicine? You know, that's the question that comes to us uh, from the students very often. And we try various ways to define it. You can see the objectives on the lower right there about the social determinants, 
about how social factors influence medical and dental knowledge and practice, uh, and so forth. But one of the challenges of social medicine, as I'm sure it will become clear over the course of this workshop, is different people have different definitions of it. And there are very different ways that it could be taught. Uh, each year we revise our curriculum and in general have a list of 10 topics uh, that bear some relation to that, li that list on the left. This is what we offered in 2022, going from the burden of disease, what are the diseases that we're trying to manage as doctors and dentists? Uh, through social determinants of health, problems of ethics of research, uh, questions of therapeutic efficacy, what's the relationship between medicine, public health, and social medicine, questions of individual responsibility and agency. One issue that has come up repeatedly uh, in feedback from students is questions about politicization of the field of social medicine. And so we've decided just to take that head on. And so that final session of the course, All Medicine and Social Medicine, currently involves case studies of gun violence and the climate crisis, uh, two topics in American medicine that are both hugely uh, important and also profoundly politicized in our current fractious uh, environment. As I said, over the past five years, the structure has been pretty stable, but we do respond to advocacy from students and from other faculty. And so we keep shifting our examples around and coming up with new material to teach. And so over the past year or two, we've added this new material on gun violence and the climate crisis. But we've also added new material about disability and disability rights and about gender minorities as well. And so people often ask, you know, what are the secrets of success to this? Uh, and there are many of them. One is school leadership. Uh, social medicine is currently not tested on the licensing exams in the United States. Medical schools are not required to teach social medicine by the American Association of Medical Colleges. Uh, so it's a discretionary course. The medical school can choose to teach it or not teach it. Uh, and the school will choose if the faculty are able to make a good case to a sympathetic leader. So in our case, the current Dean of Medical Education at Hundred happens to be a faculty member in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, which really helps. And he's also the course director of the ethics component uh, for this course, Essentials of the Profession. So as long as he is Dean, the course remains secure because as Dean, he's not gonna get rid of the course that he teaches in himself. And so that's terrific. I don't know how much longer he's willing to be Dean. And that's one of the things I do worry about is what will happen when there's a turnover. We also have to have support from the department chairs uh, who signal to their faculty whether or not they consider teaching to be an important thing to do. Most of our faculty, as I mentioned earlier, come from Harvard's teaching hospitals. Harvard Medical School does not meaningfully pay them for their efforts. It provides token compensation, and often that compensation goes to their clinical department and not to the faculty member themselves. And so we really rely on the goodwill of the faculty and their department chairs to make this course possible. And we also rely on student enthusiasm. Since social medicine, as I said, is not part of the mandated curriculum, we have to make the case to the students that the course deserves to be there. And as long as we convince them, uh, the deans will likely allow us to continue this experiment in social medicine teaching. And there have, of course, been endless obstacles. And we've written this up in a few different times. Uh, Jeremy was involved in a paper we wrote about one of the earlier incarnations of this course. Uh, we've gotten pushback from students on a number of fronts. Uh, Conservative students often think the course is too politicized, that the course pushes a left-wing agenda that has no place in a medical school curriculum. They want us to give more time to opposing viewpoints to make sure that our curriculum is fair and balanced. We, we try to respect this, but the faculty don't actually think there is a meaningful debate about the right to health care, about the toxic effects of poverty, or about the pending threat of the climate crisis. Uh, and if you accept these claims as true, much of what we consider to be social medicine follows naturally. It might look politicized, but it happens to be true and important. And so we're always trying to convince the students of that. <clears throat> Progressive students, meanwhile, complain that we don't do enough. Our Black students want more discussions of racism, especially over the past two years with the reinvigorated Black Lives Matter movement. Hispanic and Asian students want attention given to their communities, as do gender minorities, as do various intersectional identities. We got uh, critiqued last year for talking a lot about Black-white issues in American medicine and not enough specifically about Black women. 
And so we get this feedback and we do our best to incorporate it each year. Many students continue to see the course as less important than other topics, especially since it's not covered on the national licensing exams, the way that ethics and health policy is. Uh, and the faculty will complain that it's a big time commitment, 40 to 50 hours in January. They're not really well compensated. Uh, and so we have to, again, convince the faculty to continue to do this work for us. And as I said, we're very anxious to see what happens if there's a new dean or new curriculum reform. Everything we've done could be at risk. Uh, so it's currently, I think, going very well, uh, but it's an unstable balance as long as it's not required by the American Association of Medical Colleges. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. Oop, I don't, didn't leave much time, but uh, happy but to there's try. Still, there's still time for a question here and there if someone's got a clarification or a question for you, David. And again, I, I admit that I, I, I'm, I think the way to learn this is by using the Q&A function. So if, if anybody does want to raise a question, um, even if it happens after the next speaker starts, starts speaking, you can put them into the Q&A. And I see that Sharmi Hak has put one in. So here's a question for you. Other questions for David can keep filtering in this and please indicate who you're asking the question to. So to what extent does the curriculum actually meet the demands of the evolving role of the doctor? So I'll, I'll say a brief thing here. So I, I was my my description focused on the course we teach in January to the first year students, um, when a lot of the students are young and idealistic about what they're going to do in healthcare. They at the end of the first year they go off into the hospitals for a year, and then we see them again at some point during their four, third or fourth year. Uh, and again, take another pass through this material, and that's actually quite useful uh, because they learn a number of things. First, they learn that everything we taught them actually does really happen in the hospitals and the clinics. And they see firsthand the effects of poverty and everything else. Uh, and they realize how important social medicine is. But the other thing that they've learned uh, is that a lot of the doctors in the hospital don't care. And so when they get up and try to present a detailed social history, the team will say, hurry up. We don't, we don't need to know what's the diagnosis. What's the plan? How can we get this patient out of the hospital as quickly as possible? And so they definitely see competing aspects of the hidden curriculum. So thanks so much, David. And it's nice to see there's more questions coming in. I would ask, you know, please continue to put questions in the Q&A, but because they're gonna accumulate for all the speakers in the same place, if you can, let us know who you're addressing that question to when you put into the Q&A. Um, and uh, for those of you who've joined us recently, this is here, here's our international symposium on making space for social medicine and medical education. I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, uh, both uh, Emma Leverell and Ethel Rojas for making this possible, um, really. Uh, you know, and we can't thank you both enough for setting up this, this placeless place that we can all meet. Um, and But I, I'm going to pass the baton on to our second speaker, who is uh, Dr. Junji Haruta from uh, Keio University. Um, so Dr. Haruta, the floor is yours. Uh, hello. Can I hear? I can you hear. Okay, thank you. So, um, hello everyone. So, my name is Junji Haruta. So, thank you for inviting me to be a presenter uh, in online workshop for Global Social Medicine Network. At this time, I am very happy to talk about my topic. So, um, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my specialty is family medicine and medical education. I belong to Medical Education Center in Keio University in Tokyo, Japan. Today, I'd like to talk about medical students' learning experiences with an online community diagnosis. Here's the introduction. The need to engage medical students in understanding the social determinants of health in diverse communities is increasing, but medical education is still organized primarily around scientific knowledge. Medical education programs are needed to understand the perspectives of the people involved in the local community, not just the hospital setting. There are still few programs that systematically utilize the knowledge of anthropologists historians, and others to learn about the local community. Thus, 
we developed an online community diagnosis program in order to teach students at Keio University how to conduct ethnography for understanding community. In this program, the community diagnosis is defined, is defined as a compre comprehensive assessment of health status of a community. As teaching shifted to online during the pandemic, students had fewer opportunities for learning about community medicine in person. We tried to help medical students understand the social determinants of health through the program. Here is our aim. We developed an online community diagnosis program and aim to identify learning patterns of medical students. In order to answer our aim, we created the program. And so variation theory was chosen as a theoretical framework. Variation theory is characterized by core learning as discernment and variation in situations having time, space, and social dim dimension simultaneously. This theory is focused on awareness of learners. This online community diagnosis program was conducted as a part of two weeks general medicine in clinical practice for fourth and fifth year medical students. Medical students selected a local community that they are familiar with. By the last day, they should, structure, uh, they should submit the structural report. This structural report on community diagnosis consists of five steps. Step one, they categorized community information and provided hints for information retrieval. Step two, they presented examples of how to uncover local perspectives through interviews and fieldwork, as well as how to search the real estate websites for information on local residents' opinions of the community. Step three, they describe the process of conducting interviews and working around the community based on the hypothesis developed from the information gathered above, such as which generations of people work around town. Step four, they identify the community's strengths and weaknesses. The step five, they guided in planning the implementation of activities to solve the community's issues from the perspective of feasibility, cost effectiveness, and sustainability. Here is the analysis. Students' reflection on their learning through the program were thematically analyzed based on medical students' oral presentation and written reflections and reports. Continued validation and refinement of the learning patterns for 171 medical students was conducted using data collected over the two years. The following learning pattern were extracted. First pattern is reflections on local community arrested by inter integrating discovery learning and comparison. One medical student said, in preparing for my presentation, I was able to sense that the characteristics of X city that I investigated far from Tokyo were different from those of cities of the other presenters, and that the historically developed agriculture and large manufacturing plants had resulted in a fixed population and a largely elderly population. As you can see, medical students were able to reflect on the local community by identifying similarities and differences through discovery learning and comparisons. Second pattern is intrinsic interest triggered by discerning their familiar local community issues through community diagnosis. One student said, interestingly, I noticed that I have almost no network with the elderly in my neighborhood. Another student, I felt that 
the problem in urban areas can be summarized as how to support patients who do not have a sense of belonging to the community. That is, medical students analyze the issues within the local community with new perspectives gained from the five-step analysis. Third pattern is value-associated interest triggered by identifying the relationships between health programs and community data on learning responsibility. A study said the town had recently been developed and the number of young one-person households had increased around the station. The growing number of mental health clinics may be due to the large number of young people with mental health problems. As you can see, medical students can provide each individual of these learning responsibility to share their chosen, a chosen local community diagnosis. They could apply the reasoning that makes the most sense to the phenomenon in the community and find value in community diagnosis. For pattern is reflection on oneself directed by uh, so stimulating cognitive flexibility to identify complex relationships. One student said, when we see patients with hypertension and diabetes, it is not easy to imagine why they are not getting better. Through this project, I came to realize that their way of life, such as smoking habits in factories, can be an aggravating factor. As you can see, the program can allow students to develop the cognitive flexibility required to learn relationships among complex elements within a whole. Some students' perspectives change dramatically. Four patterns of learning for medical students in online community diagnosis were identified. Some students struggle to formulate a community diagnosis as they are initially regarded as a troublesome knowledge. These type of types of students had a breakthrough once they passed a certain threshold of integ integrative knowledge and they acquired a previously inaccessible way of thinking about community. Uh, thank you for attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Haruta, um, and uh, thanks for an, an expedient presentation. There's time for questions for you. So again, we'll give folks a, a, a few minutes to um, you know, use, use a question and answer function. Um, any, any questions right now uh, for, for Dr. Junji Haruta? Okay, well then, and again, if you have a question, but it just takes a moment, if you if you identify it for the speaker, there'll be time for clarifications. And we do plan, for those of you who have just joined us, an opening up into a larger Q&A after the panel discussion. Um, so our, our next um, speaker is, uh, is my co-moderator in this event, uh, Dr. Helena Hansen. And I will let Dr. Hansen introduce um, themselves. Um, uh, Let's see, I think if you just share your screen and your video, video Helena, you should be fine there. Fantastic. Hi, I'm not sure if the lighting is ideal here, but I just arrived in Oslo <laughs> um, on the way to a conference. And so I am just catching up with what you've already covered. I think perhaps what I can provide, and hopefully you can see me here, Perhaps what I can provide is a little bit of an overview of an approach that I and many colleagues on this line, um, especially those from the US have been co-developing over the years. So it's an approach called structural competency that grew out of my work and the work of many of us here to introduce the social science or social scholarship concept of structures. Um, public policies, institutions such as schools and um, law enforcement and housing agencies, as well as neighborhood conditions as drivers of health outcomes in 
probably anywhere in the world, but in the US, it's um, very stark how um, inequalities in health are driven by the conditions and public policies and institutions that people and our patients interact with. So let me try to get to the right slide. We'll be just a moment. Okay. And so what I think many of us on this line share is an interest in how can the insights from social scholarship, particularly critical social scholarship about how inequalities arise from the social conditions and the social hierarchies that we live in, how can that be addressed in clinics and or by people who are clinical practitioners? And so I'll start with a book, a book cover. Um, it's the host of a book that many of the people on this panel contributed to. Can you see my, my screen now? Or you did for a second, okay. Let me just try one more time. Okay, how about now? You can see it now. Okay, let me make it full screen. Okay, so this is a book that I'm happy to distribute. I might even try to post it in PDF form in the chat. But essentially structural competency is an approach to clinical training and clinical practice rather than a prescribed um, set of steps or a cookbook. Uh, it's not a specific curriculum. It's an orientation towards clinical practice and training that um, can take many different forms depending on which people you're working with clinically and what the, what the prominent structures are that are influencing health outcomes. So this is a book that we published um, that includes case studies, essentially descriptions of cases where structural competency as an approach has been implemented in medical, primarily medical schools across the US. And it, it gives you a sense of how inventive people have been on the ground as they specifically address local health problems. One of the first things that I find I have to do in working with clinical audiences, mostly in medical schools, is to introduce them to the idea of social structures, because most medical practitioners in the US are not required to study social science, are not required to learn theory about what kinds of structures um, social life takes that often constrain people's choices, constrain their, their chances, and direct them on one pathway as opposed to another. And so I use two examples to distinguish structural drivers of health from social determinants of health. So in the US, when people talk about social determinants of health, they're often talking about screening patients in the clinic for things that might predict a poor health outcome if they're not addressed. You know, does the patient in front of me have stable housing or not? Um, does the patient in front of me have any involvement with the criminal legal system? Have they been arrested? Have they been to jail or prison? These things are very strong determinants of their health outcomes. So in clinical spaces, we're more and more getting used to the idea that we should be asking these things when we see patients because they have such a big impact on their health. But what we don't often ask as clinicians is a less individual question and a more population or neighborhood-based question. In the US, for example, homelessness or unstable housing is very unequal. There are certain neighborhoods that experience much, much more of it than other neighborhoods. There are certain populations that experience much, much more than others. So to understand it at that level, you have to have an idea of structures such as public policies. Uh, in the US, we had over the past several decades, a policy of uh, the government leveling housing in poor and in black or uh, Latinx, Latin American neighborhoods um, and displacing the residents from their homes. Uh, so policies like urban renewal or planned shrinkage did just that. And that had a terrible impact on health outcomes. So that is a public policy that is a structure, a social structure determining health. And then in the US, of course, we've had two years of a lot of discussion about uh, the racial race and class bias in law enforcement, arrests, jail, and prison sentences. And so for that, we have to understand how 
law enforcement, sentencing, and imprisonment have been so unequally distributed by race and also by, also by class. The policies that drive that, those are structures. And then that concept of structure borrowed from the social sciences is at the bottom of the term structural competency. So the term structure is used, um, I use it in clinical settings to indicate that we don't, we need to shift our attention from the individual behavior of a patient to what surrounds the patient. What community conditions are they living in? Which um, institutions are they interacting with? Ranging from the criminal justice system to schools, to parks and public space, and also community organizations. And then second, the word competency to signal that as clinical practitioners, we actually have to be able to do something to address those structural drivers of health. It's not enough to just know about them, we actually have to be able to do something about them. And so the structural competencies are essentially recognizing and um, reframing the patient's health problems in terms of their structural drivers, rather than just focusing on that individual patient and their behaviors or choices. And then the third bullet here is the most difficult one. Um, that's where I spend a lot of my time, and you're probably going to hear many, many examples on this panel, and you just did hear an example on this panel, of how we in medical schools are putting into practice um, acting on those structures, because classroom time is terrific, but we are practitioners. We practice medicine, and so we have to know what to do, how to practice differently, and we need to um, create opportunities in medical training for people to have those experiences and then to address structural drivers of health. And then lastly, we have to develop structural humility, meaning working in a collaborative way with those people outside of medicine who have expertise that we don't necessarily have in medicine, such as community organizing or uh, advocating for public policies that would have a, a good impact on our patients' health outcomes. So for that, we can collaborate with community organizers and collaborate with policy advocates and give it the time that it deserves. So these things are what we call structural humility. And then I'm gonna end just by walking through some examples based on of how this looks in practice, based on a rubric that I've come up with, um, different levels of structure that we as clinical practitioners can intervene upon. So the, the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest way to intervene on structures is in the clinic itself where we already are and are already seeing patients. So for example, electronic medical records in the US, increasingly we're putting questions in the electronic medical records that clinicians use to screen, to assess patients for diagnoses and for treatments. Um, putting questions in those electronic medical records about whether the patient has, for example, stable housing or has had an arrest and has been to jail or prison, just as two examples. So that in itself has been shown to increase the number of referrals for social services that we give patients coming to the clinic. The second um, example is medical legal partnerships, which in the US means pairing clinical practitioners, medical students and medical school faculty with pro lawyers that are volunteering their time or with law students to pursue patients' cases um, that are legal court cases. Um, and then social prescribing is a practice whereby a clinical practitioner writes a prescription for a patient uh, that has to do with a social need and then hands it over to um, a, navig a community health worker or an agency that helps that patient. So for example, if a patient needs help with applying for a certain disability benefit, the clinician will write that prescription and hand it over to um, a community health worker or an organization that can walk the patient through. And then lastly, peer navigation. So peer navigator in the US refers to somebody who has lived experience with a particular condition ranging from addiction to diabetes. That's somebody who has lived experience who can help a patient navigate the healthcare system and social services. And then community health workers are people from heavily affected communities, usually poor communities um, for example, immigrant communities or low-income Black or Latinx communities that have experience with the kinds of social conditions in those communities that lead to poor health outcomes. They work as a part of the clinical team, and that in itself is a change to the structure of the clinical team. Um, and then the next level of structure 
that we can intervene upon is through partnering with community organizations that have the trust of local people. Um, and that's an issue in the US where many people who are either, you know, immigrants, maybe undocumented, don't have trust uh, in public officials or public clinics, or they've been so badly treated within the public health care system, which is very common in low communities that they don't want to come in for care. Um, so putting, collaborating with community organizations to even put clinical services there. For example, on the right side, you see an image in the center of my colleague, Ayana Jordan, who is an, addic an addiction psychiatrist who partners with Black and Latinx churches. I just skipped um, to the next slide. Partners with Black and Latinx churches to provide addiction treatment and recovery support right there. There's an analogous um, program in Native American healing centers that's portrayed on the left hand of this slide. Okay, so the, I'm almost done with my slide deck. This is the third level of structure upon which we can intervene, which is to collaborate with non-health sector agencies. So here's an image of a psychiatrist, Minnie Fully Love, who has in the US long studied the negative health impact of racial segregation in US cities. And she has been working with architects and urban planters, planners to integrate U.S. cities um, by taking down dividers such as highway overpasses and replacing them with green spaces and commercial zones, local businesses that bring different neighborhoods together. So that's her health intervention. And she's a doctor of cities, so to speak, working on the pathologies of cities rather than individuals. And I'll end with the last level of structure, which is policy advocacy. So in the United States, drug policy drives a lot of the inequalities in um, jail and prison sentences and in health outcomes. And in the bottom right-hand corner from, public, from punishment to public health, it's an organization of clinicians, uh, as well as disenchanted law enforcement officials and formerly incarcerated people that are getting trained. This is a group that trains physicians and other healthcare providers to give testimony to policymakers about the health impact of laws that are being considered. Um, and it's all, it's all intended to redirect people away from incarceration, from jail and prison towards mental health treatment uh, when they need it. So I will end with this slide, which is just an invitation. We've already shared some of the resources on this website um, and many people on the panel have contributed to documenting online some of the materials they use and the training approaches that they use. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansen. Um, I think there are some questions accumulating for you in the Q&A and other questions specifically for Dr. Hansen, please type them into the Q&A and, and she can type them in as well. I think there might be time to ask one, which is from uh, Micah, uh, asking the focus of today is very much medical schools, medical students, clinical practitioners. In reality, we all know, I assume, in the work we are doing around social medicine, social determinants of health is very important to work in an interdisciplinary and intersectoral way. How can we work on this in our training? And so, Helen, I know you have some thoughts. Yeah, no, I think that's a really fantastic question. And the answer to why um, I and my colleagues have been so focused on medical schools is that physicians in the US anyway have been very late to the party. I would say we're quite far behind other disciplines, <laughs> social work, nursing, um, also community health movements. We're so far behind. Uh, so medical schools are among the most narrow individually focused um, places involved in clinical training. And so we've really doubled down. And also I happen to be an MD and many of my colleagues that are working on this are either MDs or jointly trained social scientists uh, and physicians. Uh, we're trying to use our insider status to get some ideas and approaches into mainstream medical schools that have been around for a very long time and have been practiced quite successfully by other disciplines. And so a big part of our agenda is to get people skillful and oriented to collaborating across disciplines. Uh, remember I talked about structural humility, for example, one reason why we were so deliberate about structural humility as a concept is in the US physicians are often, because they're used to being at the top of the hierarchy of clinical teams, um, they often have a hubris of knowing all and making all decisions where actually successful work in this area requires that you acknowledge your limits of expertise 
and seek out people. Often, oftentimes they're community members who may not even have higher education, but are very skillful when it comes to assessing what the needs of the community are and addressing them. Um, and so that's the whole um, concept of structural humility and the real emphasis on collaboration, not only across disciplines, but across walks of life. It's because you're so right. What you're implying in your question is that this requires a broad range of people, many of whom are not currently recognized in mainstream uh, medical schools as having expertise when actually they have often the very expertise that makes the difference in health outcomes. Thanks so much for that. And of course, we'll get to take these questions back up again in the panel discussion, I hope. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kenneth Camargo, who uh, joins us from the uh, Universidad do Estado do Rio de Janeiro and with the Department of Social Medicine there. So, uh, Dr. Camargo. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, let me put my presentation on. Well, as I said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professor of the Instituto de Medicina Social. Uh, I was originally trained as a physician. All my postgraduate studies were in public health, and here we I, I tended much to the social science side. I'm also an associate editor of the American Journal of Public Health. In my presentation, I felt the need to provide some contextual information first, because a lot of things are very specific to Brazil. First of all, the, the name itself. Uh, we rarely speak of social medicine here. We use the term Saúde Coletiva, which we use something like collective health. Uh, which is a new denomination that was adopted by the end of the 70s in order to better reflect uh, the interdisciplinary nature of the field. And it's, it's a complex field that is geared towards studying the, the health of populations. Um, and, oh, sorry, <laughs> I skipped it. Okay, and it has been uh, structured around these three subdomains, health policy, planning and management, epidemiology, social sciences, and humanities in health, has a very strong emphasis on critical thinking and has from the very start been very associated with progressive politics. Uh, the, okay. The setting which we teach is another institution, and, and that's a, some, something I have to get into some detail into, because the medical school, Faculdade de Ciências Médicas, is a separate uh, unit from Instituto de Medicina Social. Uh, it is the third oldest medical school in Rio de Janeiro, although it was founded in 36. Uh, it's older than the university itself. It was part of the nucleus that created the university a couple of years, a few years after it was created. And it was the first medical school in Rio de Janeiro to have its own uh, university hospital, which was very important later on because this hospital uh, became associated with the uh, Ministry of Social Security and provided healthcare for the people who were insured through Social Security, thus exposing medical students to the realities of medical care at that point in the, the, in the, the country and the city. Uh, it has one of the main uh, programs in family, uh, uh, community and family health in the country, and this is very important because they are allies from our perspective. And uh, another thing that's very important that the student body has been very active, active politically throughout its history. Uh, and this was very important in Brazilian history. I won't get into detail unless someone asked for it, but there was a struggle against the military dictatorship. Those students have a very important participation. And some of those students uh, who graduated from the school later became professors and were involved in the creation of the Institute of Medicina Social. Uh, one of them, Ezio Cordeiro, who now, unfortunately, no longer with us, uh, gives name to our institution. And also Professor Moisés Clo, who is currently, uh, not currently, for a long time, has been a professor at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, but a few disciplines that were previously with the Department of, of Hygiene and Preventive Medicine uh, in the medical school uh, stayed with us, uh, with Institute of Medicine and Social. This is the first complication that we have, that we are from another institute teaching the medical students, and there are all sorts of power disputes that sometimes interfere with the program. Uh, and among them, we had an introductory course that was named Fundamentos de Saúde Coletiva, which lent it, itself to a, a very unsavory acronym in Portuguese. And we later changed that to Saúde Coletiva 1. And the program was reformulated in the mid 90s by a group of uh, professors who, not by coincidence, were all egressors from the same medical schools, including yours truly. Uh, medical education in Brazil has, that's very, is very different from what you have in North America. 
Uh, it begins, higher education begins right after high school. Uh, we have to take a, a, a very tough admission exam after uh, high school to enter the university. The public universities, as a general rule, uh, have the more valued courses, particularly in medicine. And those are being are more disputed, and medicine is among the most, most sought, sought after. So it's a, a very bitter dispute. And the private schools, on the other hand, are very expensive uh, for the students. It's a six year full time course. Uh, almost half of the medical schools are concentrated on uh, southeastern Brazil in cities that are very expensive to live in. So all these factors lead to an elitization of the student bodies in a country that is already highly unequal in economical terms, social and economical terms. This has been a little softened in the last, uh, I'd say 10, 20 years because of pol policies for uh, affirmative actions that have been adopted. But even then, there is still a great difference between the social cultural background of the students and the reality of the health situation of most of the Brazilian population. We don't have licensing for uh, physicians after they conclude the medical course, but we do have, uh, th there is a, a, a heavy regulation by the Ministry of Education and minimum requirements for the courses, all courses, including medicine. And the set of um, mandatory guidelines, which were updated in 2014, they have recommendations, six recommendations for the curriculum. Uh, three of the of them, uh, which are directly related to contents that uh, we use to deal with in, in uh, collective health, uh, like, for instance, understanding social, cultural, behavioral, psychological, and so on and so forth, determinants at individual and collective health of the health disease process, uh, approach to the health disease process of the individual and the population, multiple aspects of determination, health promotion, uh, activities related to the social and physical environment and so on and so forth. So uh, unlike what uh, David was talking about Harvard, uh, in the medical schools have to have this kind of contents. How they are implemented vary a lot, but there is some legal backing to provide some uh, security for the presence of the course. Even then, uh, I want to get into this, just to give a visual. This is the, the, the curriculum. Uh, each box is one specific course of the first four years of medical school in our uh, university. And if you look at it, the two pink lilac uh, courses that are provided by Instituto de Medicina Social, one of them is the one that I'm going to talk about more because it's the one I have experience with, uh, Saúde Coletiva 1, and the other one, Saúde Coletiva 2. So, uh, two. Uh, and if you look at it, they are, they are a very small fraction of the total course. Uh, in the case of the specific uh, course that we are talking about, the first one, uh, we'll see it's just a small percentage. There is yet another discipline in during the internship. They have a two year internship. It's basically in service training. And the total course is 9,635 hours in six years. Um, the other two courses, uh, three and uh, two and three, are basically clinical epidemiology, and I won't deal with them because they, they are very specific within epidemiology and very tied to the general medical thinking. Uh, this is from the syllabus from the course. The general objective is this explore collective health contents related to the medical rationalities and their implications for medical and health practices, and has specific objectives. Examine the ways in which physicians can contribute to improving the health of a population. Use social and health indicators to characterize the health status of the Brazilian population and its changes over time and across geographic regions. That's where we introduce all the discussion about social determinants. And analyze the potential and the limits of medical practice with regard to improving the health conditions of the population. And this is the summary of what the contents of what we teach. Uh, the physician's placement in contemporary society, uh, meanings of being as doctor, and the characteristics of medical work, the concept of disease and its implications for medical practice, characteristics of specifically medical tasks and peculiarities of caring for chronic conditions, uh, means to identify the health status of the population, and rationale and strategies to improve the health of populations, acting on risk factors, vaccination, early diagnosis, medical therapy, with emphasis on pharmacological approaches, and epidemiological surveillance. Uh, the way that we provide the course is through weekly seminars uh, on, on Thursday morning. This is important because on Thursday afternoon, they have anatomy and, and you see that sometimes this is a problem. Uh, that takes 15 weeks, a, a total of 75 hours. 
the whole class, uh, several around 100 students per year. It's at, uh, the entrance exam is just uh, about 100 students per year, it's not per semester. Uh, so they are divided in four groups of approximately 25 students. Each of them is allocated to one specific professor full-time from Instituto. And we use a variety of methods. Uh, it's mainly group discussion. We, they have reading materials that they have to read before uh, class that unfortunately not, not always happens. Uh, but we also use dramatizations. We dramatize a medical consultation, for instance. Uh, we have, they have to make a seminar at the end of the course about specific issues as part of the grading. They, they are evaluated by frequency in, in the seminars, the presentation of the seminar and two tests that are done. And also expert panels, which we try to invite people from outside uh, with regards to specific issues. For instance, we, we used to have a panel about HIV and AIDS. We invited people from uh, that work with HIV AIDS NGOs to talk to the medical students about the challenges that they're, they're being faced by the population. And we use diverse materials, a few texts that we have written ourselves that we have, have made available uh, in Google Drive, but unfortunately they're all in Portuguese, so I don't, don't know how many people will really have access to that. Um, but also a lot of materials from the uh, Brazilian Health Ministry and some videos that we use. Uh, we, we use, for instance, for a sort of sensitization class of just at the beginning, a segment from a Monty Python movie, the, the meaning of life, that for those who have watched it, that bit about uh, giving birth in the first world, which provide a lot of very interesting discussion from the students. The main challenge that we face, uh, first of all, is the uh, we got a counter hegemonic approach and a heavily biomedical institution. Uh, and that's what I was referring to. When they have, for instance, a, 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 an exam in anatomy in the afternoon, the, the classroom, our classroom is empty in the morning. So they tend to privilege this kind of information. Uh, our approach is at odds with most of the course, which relies heavily on rote memorization, unfortunately. We have a very limited time to work with the students, just a, a, around 0.78% of the total time they have uh, in, in the course of the gigantic course, even in the, in the last two years of uh, internship, the discipline that we have, which again is, is uh, uh, clinical epidemiology, is less than 2% of the total time that they have. It's confined to the very beginning of the medical course. This is a problem because uh, uh, Elena was talking about how important it is to have this connection with practice. They have absolutely no connection to practice. The first two years are basically theoretical and dedicated to basic science. So they are not having any contacts with patients. Much of what we're telling them is quite abstract. Um, we have a problem with the class origin of most of the student body. What David was talking about, the, the conservative background, is they are not necessarily conservative. But uh, for the most part, they come from very sheltered families and, and they are not very familiar with the realities of the, and the hardships of life uh, for poorer people and actually for the majority of the population in Brazil. So a lot of the things that we're talking about uh, is, is very, very abstract for them. And we are talking about, as I said, people come from high school straight into university. So we're talking about, <laughs> from my point of view, basically kids just out of high school. Uh, and I said, it's a young age. I don't know if that's a challenge or not, because on the other hand, being younger, they are much more open and, and uh, much more willing to discuss the subjects that we're trying to, to bring about. The problem is that when they get to the end of medical school, five years, uh, five years and a half after they have the last contact with us, I fear that much of what we try to inculcate into them has been lost. Uh, fortunately, they also have exposure to the people in the uh, community and family health program. So I think that sort of counterbalances it. Um, so that's what I have prepared to present. I thank you once again for the invitation and if we have time for questions. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we do have time for a question. If, if anyone wants to address a question um, specifically to Dr. Camargo right now, um, I'll, I'm going to give it a moment. Um, and even if it doesn't strike you right at this moment, those of you who have specific questions um, about the experience um, at, at the Universidad do Estado de Rio de Janeiro um, can, can, can put them into the text box of the Q&A and bring them up in the, in the discussion later. Um, our 
Our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Kelly Knight, who is joining us from the University of California in San Francisco. And I will let Dr. Knight introduce herself as well. All yours, Kelly. Great. Thank you, um, Jeremy. Let me just get this to look right. OK, hopefully um, everybody can can see the slides. I can't see you, so I'm going to assume that everything's OK unless anybody tells me otherwise. Great. Okay. So I'm going to. OK, perfect. I'm going to talk a little bit about the social medicine uh, curriculum and also some initiatives um, that have gone on at UCSF. Um, and um, I want to start. I really appreciate uh, Helena giving the overview of structural competency, because um, that's sort of where I'm going to start here in terms of talking about some of the um, more recent uh, reforms that have happened to our curriculum in relationship to social medicine, really starting in 2015, but earlier than that, starting in 2014 with the formation of the Bay Area Structural Competency Working Group, um, in which we focused, it was a group of health professionals, anthropologists, sociologists, really coming out of the physician scholars movement and a structural competency conference that we held at UCSF in, in 2014, a national conference, to really think about how structural competency might be integrated. And a group of us got together. There was a graduate course that I co-taught with Seth Holmes at Berkeley. And from there, some curricula was generated um, that has evolved over time. And um, I brought to UCSF in 2016, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's a three to four hour um, curriculum in full. And so what we did at, at UCSF was a, was a shorter version of that. But we have done the group, the Bay Area group has, has um, uh, open sourced the full curriculum. And I have a link to that and the links have been provided. So I'm happy to talk more about that. But we've done over 100 structural competency training since 2015. And as Helena pointed out, structural competency is really um, a framework that is adaptable and flexible, but really wants to, to sort of take the starting point of social determinants of health where poverty and inequality are producing poor health outcomes, and that's well understood from uh, multiple <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years really, but at least five generations of, of clinical and community epidemiology and really ask sort of what are the policies, economic systems, and social hierarchies that are producing the poverty and inequality that are then producing poor health. And as Helena pointed out, we're, we're calling those structures and we wanna think about structural competency as a broader framework to train physicians and other health professionals to, to both understand or recognize the roles of structures in producing poor health outcomes and um, healthcare trajectories and also respond to them. And we call that the structural determinants of the social determinants of health. So when thinking about bringing that to UCSF, we really wanted to really have the, our trainees um, in undergraduate medical education think about why people are poor or sick and borrowing from Barbara Major's work, really having sort of a, a starting point of no one really has the right to work with poor people unless they have a real analysis of why people are poor and how that poverty might be impacting their health. So that brings us forward to the, anyway, to the more recent um, reforms that have happened at UCSF, which we call the Bridges Curriculum. It is also a two month or an eight week integrated social and behavioral sciences content in sort of two forms, two courses, health in the individual and health in society. And when I joined in 2015, those were already well established, really focused on, again, understanding where health disparities are occurring and what are the social determinants of those health disparities. And then we brought in some pieces um, around structural competency to provide a framework. I've also worked um, because of my own field um, is um, in addiction medicine and um, looking at the, particularly the healthcare experiences of people who use drugs, harm reduction programs and other policies and healthcare interventions that can hurt or harm people who use drugs along their life trajectories. Um, I also taught an understanding addiction course that borrowed from law, medicine, and social sciences to frame addiction conceptually and then look at how it operates in the field um, of medicine and healthcare. And then um, in the second year, sort of bridging off of some of what we've heard from other speakers, um, there was a group of us um, also involved in structural competency and social medicine who were part of the um, New England Journal of Medicine case studies in social medicine. And one of the case studies that, that I helped 
to put together and lead along with my colleagues, um, um, Andrea Jackson, Ashish Prem Kumar and Laura Duncan at UCSF was to create a case um, that borrowed from um, the concepts of reproductive justice or reproductive justice and structural vulnerability and see how that would apply in a clinical setting. And we deliberately designed this particular small group course to happen during clinical rotation. So while the, the, the MS2 or the second year students are approaching um, and in, on the wards and in the OBGYN rotation, they then meet with us on a Wednesday and work through the larger sort of societal structural issues related to the experiences of those who are structurally marginalized in particularly in OBGYN care. So that's just some examples of, of some of the things that we've done as part of the Bridges curriculum. But I wanna talk a little bit more um, about the structure of the institution of academic medicine itself and the ways that these kind of curricular reforms can evolve over time um, as a little bit, rather than a deep dive into the specifics of curriculum, I kind of wanna talk a little bit about process and also some alternatives or where we're at now in UCSF. So I created this timeline, which you can see goes off the page and that's on purpose because it's a work in progress and certainly not over. But as I said, started in 2014, um, 2015, when, when it was really student driven. And I think that's really important. So the white coats for black lives die-in that happened in December of 2014 um, was a catalyst for the deans and administrators and faculty at UCSF to redesign their, per, their pr previously planned retreat to focus on uh, addressing racism in medicine specifically and um, coincided with the launch of the Differences Matter um, broad social medicine initiative at UCSF that had multiple components, including addressing uh, health disparities and the role of race and racism in curriculum, which is the, the piece that I worked on, as well as pipeline programs and other institutional efforts um, to address that sort of at a multi-level way, not just with undergraduate medical education. Um, in 2016, we launched the Bridges curriculum and I gave the first uh, lecture in structural competency in December of 2016, immediately after uh, a few days after the, uh, the election, um, which was an interesting time to introduce structural competency into the curriculum. And we did a qualitative evaluation of the Bridges curriculum from the perspective of students who were underrepresented in medicine. And that term refers to African-American, um, indigenous or Native American and Latinx students. Um, it's a medical education term that we use in the US. And we did a qualitative evaluation, which was published in the book that Helena has shared as a PDF to really identify what are the experiences of this new curriculum that's really trying to address racism in medicine, trying to look at health disparities from a social medicine perspective. What are we accomplishing there? Um, and we were able to do that evaluation in collaboration with the students. Um, and I'll, I bring that up because we, we, there's important things to recognize around how evaluation is or isn't working um, in these settings. And over time, we saw this period of structural competency being expanded to the MS2 or the second year clerkship period of time and later, and then also contracted as multiple forms of, um, of uh, curricular change would happen. For example, we had a day long structural competency follow up that we felt really good about, we worked really hard on, and that all the next year went online into uh, asynchronous um, uh, modules. So a lot of just pointing out a lot of things that were institutionally out of our control in terms of how the curriculum uh, came, uh, came, to, uh, came to the students over time. And I think there was costs as a result of that. Um, in 2020, two projects that I'm gonna talk about, the Anti-Oppressive Curricular Initiative, which is a school of medicine program and the Repair Project, which I'm gonna talk about in detail, which is housed within my Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at UCSF, were both launched. And then we had an experience in the fall of 2021 where racial trauma was experienced in the health and the individual small groups. So part of the social medicine curriculum was actually traumatizing, particularly to black students, had a huge institutional response and moved toward reform, which is the sort of the period that we're in now of revising health and the individual, health and society, and reviewing all the MS1 through four curricula with a focus on not doing harm. Um, and I'm happy to revisit and questions sort of our processes around that. But I wanted to show this, this evolution um, because it's not, a, as, as David pointed out with the Harvard curriculum, this is not a, a, a static um, intervention in social medicine. It's one that's constantly 
needing to reinvent itself and it needs other forms of support. So the anti-oppressive curricular initiative, I'm not gonna go into a, a lot of detail around this, but this is a three-year initiative that I'm part of as a curricular, core curricular liaison. So I work specifically with three different courses to evaluate um, whether or not their materials and pedagogy are, um, are anti-oppressive and anti-racist. And this is something that again, started in 2021 that's evolving and very actively involved in the, in the reform of social medicine curriculum at UCSF. So I have two slides for gaps and challenges because there are many. Um, and again, I'm happy to, to speak in detail, but one of them is the issue of reputation management versus real change. So the ways in which social medicine can be critiqued by students or um, a focus on anti-racist medicine specifically can be critiqued by students as performative rather than actually producing reform. Um, and so how do we respond to students' disappointment and anger around the lack of progress and inconsistency in the curriculum? And, and are we being responsive institutionally? And what are the responses that are most appropriate for that? We have some outmoded pedagogy, particularly the small groups in h and that I mentioned that we're perpetuating racial trauma. And we need to really pay attention through our evaluation modalities to really understand where harm might be happening. We had evaluated that curriculum in its first year and identified some of the challenges that then came to haunt the curriculum in 2021. So really um, attending to the ways that we conduct our evaluation to make sure that we're assessing the impact of the curriculum. And then there's gaps in faculty knowledge and skills. Not only are faculty often vol you know, volunteering their time and that's a structure in US medical education that I think deserves a critique in and of itself. Um, but um, not all faculty are adequately supported or prepared to deliver some of the curriculum. So faculty um, development is, is a really important component of social medicine. Um, the second uh, group of, uh, of, of challenges or gaps that, that we've identified are contradictions within the institution on the use of race and the impact of racism. So <clears throat> students getting different messages in different parts of the curriculum around what is race, what is the category of race, how is race being used, um, and the impact of racism particularly. Uh, medicalization, medical hegemony, and the culture of academic medicine itself is fairly rigid uh, or very rigid as Helena pointed out, and that can, that can um, really limit the amount of reading students can be assigned, the kinds of exposures that they can have, um, and the kinds of critical conversations that can be engaged in at times when they're, when they're wedged into um, small curricular um, intervention units. The management of whiteness in a historically white institution is a critical issue. Um, at UCSF and many other institutions that I think doesn't get enough discussion, both in terms of the positionality of those who are involved in social medicine as champions, as instructors, as supporters, um, as well as recognizing what is the role of historically white institutions in perpetuating um, structural violence through, the, through their pedagogy um, and their institutional praxis and, uh, and how can we operate in critique of that um, while trying to uh, institute reform. Um, we need a needed evolution in structural competency and we've been able to do that outside of medical education, but it needs to happen within UCSF's core curriculum with, again, as Helena pointed out, a focus on praxis. And we need a, a community engagement that's meaningfully institutionalized. This is still a, a, a gap and a lack at UCSF despite a multiple uh, decades of conversation about it. So how do we make space for it? I wanna talk about the repair project um, as one example um, where the critical importance of efforts to exist inside, for example, through the anti-oppressive initiative and through other initiatives that UCSF has tried to do within medical education and also have a life outside medical education. So how does that, how can that synergize? And humanities and social science engagement that's critically and theoretically grounded is really important and it can offer a break from the rigid pedagogy of undergraduate medical education. And <clears throat> the repair project has done that at UCSF. Um, it also offers a functional and supportive student faculty involvement in co-creation. It's a non-hierarchical structure, which I think is really critical for doing um, uh, more um, expansive and interesting work in social medicine. And it involves meaningful commun community input, engagement and co-creation. So repair is a three-year initiative in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, my department, that's designed to address anti-Black racism in science and medicine. 
we have three uh, foci, each one each year. Medical reparations was year one, medical abolition is year two, which is just finishing. And then we're starting decolonizing the health sciences as our year three focus. Um, I'm not gonna read all this, this is all available on the website, but I wanted to say one of the things consistent with social medicine is that in repair, we're trying to offer an open space for critical engagement. So our mission is not to deliver remedies as prescriptive modes of pedagogy, but rather to um, open space for critical engagement and shaping fields of scholarship, teaching, medical practice to alter the present and shape a better future. <clears throat> and that openness and critique, I think, is, is what we're bringing from the humanities and social sciences that really needs to have a place in social medicine and in medicine itself. We've accomplished a lot in the form of um, campus forums and medical reparations. There's a list. We've done teach-ins around a variety of subjects um, and also um, another uh, campus forum on, on imagining medical abolition that includes current students, former students and faculty, and outside experts all in an interdisciplinary um, and transdisciplinary dialogue around what me medical abolition would look like. And then my last slide, I want to talk about an academic community partnership that Repair is also supporting, but was developed earlier that I'm involved in uh, with the Tenderloin neighborhood, which is a, a, a very structurally marginalized neighborhood in San Francisco and UC Health Equity Collaborative. We meet weekly um, with a community driven agenda to discuss what we want to do, what the community wants UCSF to do, how, how they want us to partner with them and what role students and faculty could have. We've co-created a structural competency training that's community facing with community members to see how we want to adapt structural competency to be relevant to their experiences of health, illness, and medicine. And importantly, we've created a community grand rounds structure where we flip the script of expertise and the community members like the members of Skywatchers who are photographed here, who, who have created the community grand rounds as part of this collaborative, talk about their experiences with medical trauma, um, their experiences of accessing healthcare. We try and repair the harm through dialogue in this training, and then we train physicians to have an anti-racist praxis. So that's just one example, I think, within the context of repair of how some of the uh, important focus on community engagement um, and on really addressing anti-racist praxis in medicine can be realized. And here is my information. Please reach out to me. I'm happy to share any materials and answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks so much, Kelly. I've just, sorry, I think I'm having trouble with my own internet here, but uh, hopefully I can be heard and seen. Um, Thanks for that. I um, would urge those of you with questions um, about the repair project and questions about structural competency UCSF to put them in the Q&A box for, for, uh, for, for Kelly Knight and address them to Dr. Knight. Um, I, I want to, um, to move on to our next uh, presenter who is Dr. Carla Tampiras who joins us um, from the uh, University of Cape Town. Um, uh, Carla, I can't, oh, there you are, fantastic, okay. Um, the, the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. So first of all, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are currently located. It's lovely to be part of this uh, panel and to be able to share some of um, our experiences from UCT. I would like to acknowledge my colleague, Sarah Crawford-Brown, who is in the audience, who is the other half of those of us who make trouble in this section in the health sciences education where we work, and also my colleague, Ishak Date, who is here too. So thank you very much for being up late and being here. Um, so I, I toyed slightly with the uh, title because in some ways what we've been trying to do is to make space for what is termed in some context social medicine, but also for us is bound and linked to the ideas of medical and health humanities in a health sciences curricula where we teach is a health sciences faculty, so it doesn't have a standalone medical school in that context. And there is a particular historical legacy around why the mistaken hangover of recalling it a medical school has proved politically problematic on our campus in the last, in the last little while. Um, so just to give some sort of context of what that means, we teach 
in two sort of spaces, the upper campus where a lot of the postgraduate work done, and that's a humanities and social sciences campus. Most of what I'll be talking about today is the stuff that we teach on the health sciences campus. They are only eight minutes apart by car and yet pedagogically and practically and theoretically and in very many other ways, often worlds apart. In terms of a brief overview of some of the adjustments in our curriculum, Post 1994, there was often obviously a quite big push to reconfigure the way health science faculties engaged and understood their roles and functions. Uh, it, in terms of UCT itself, the what is today the Faculty of Health Sciences was established uh, in 1912. Um, more recently, in terms of curriculum change, about a decade or over a decade ago now, there was a move um, in the faculty towards a problem-based, a facilitated problem-based learning approach, integrated curriculum. And that curriculum was very informed and predicated on embedding in the teaching framework the primary healthcare principles, so the, the health for all principles as a, a foundational space from which learning was meant to take place. Uh, in addition to that, there has always been a strong especially in the last few decades, emphasis on social determinants of health, public health. And part of that new curriculum that came around had embedded in it an idea that there should be a social science or humanities type component, initially deployed to infiltrate or, or, or to bring to the fore a, a term called cultural competence, which um, as a historian I, I, is, is, gives me the heebie-jeebies in all sorts of ways, but I won't go into that now. Out of that came a course that was called Culture, Psych and Illness. Um, in 2014, uh, I was appointed at the Faculty of Health Sciences and myself and my colleague, Sarah Corbett Brown, began revising that course and turning it into a course called Critical Health Humanities. We're currently at a point where after a series of kind of stop-stop curricular review as a result of the protest actions and student um, protest over the last few years, a new curriculum review process is underway uh, that is looking at kind of dealing with some of the key questions that have come up around the curriculum over the last few years, including how and if and why the, the curriculum should be decolonized, what the curriculum might look like to be if it was to be more inclusive, and that process is currently underway. So what I tell you now may not be here by 2024, but for now, this is what we have. So we teach uh, kind of social medicine or medical health humanities. And if I was to, to provide a kind of symbolic um, image to explain what we try and do, essentially at the, at, the, at the core of the work we're trying to do is to help students to develop the capacities to recognize that all oppression is connected and to very clearly articulate how the social, economic, political, um, and historical components of not only the country in which they're practicing or the countries in which they're practicing, but the people with whom they'll be engaged in the education system they've been exposed to, even the physical structures in which they are learning are linked to modes of being that are often deeply embedded in oppression. So in terms of what the health sciences curricula looks like, the first year is the only year in the faculty where all the students, regardless of what they go on to study, are together. So there's one year at first year level where all the students do an introduction to becoming a health professional. Um, Kenneth, much like the situation in Brazil, the students to, to come to us tend to come straight out of high school. And then if they're doing the MBCHB, which is the medical degree, are uh, in the institution for six years. If they're doing one of the health or rehabilitation sciences, it's usually four years. And then both of those have a community service um, aspect to them. After that first year, the students begin to, to do curricula in, in different timetables at different times and at different times between the years. So there, there's no such thing as a, a health sciences timetable. There are multiple parallel running timetables. So often capacities to look for spaces in such a complex space where there can be an interlap an overlap between health sciences students becomes incredibly difficult. 
In terms of what and where we teach, at an undergraduate level, we teach this thread called Critical Health Humanities. For MBCHB, it's termed a golden thread, although considering the plus of platinum, we should probably change that to a platinum thread. Um, and it runs across the second and third years of the uh, MBCHB program. So that's around 18 months in total. Uh, in that golden thread, uh, which is part of the integrated course or integrated curriculum, which I'll explain in a little while, we have around 24 lectures and access to space in the facilitated problem-based learning context. So for that 18 month period in the first, there'll be around 200 to 270 students. So over that 18 month period, essentially we're looking at around, around 400 students, but we only see them in kind of batches of 200 at a time. We also teach um, in the physiotherapy third year course. We teach a semester long course there uh, that forms part of a, a, a a broader course called Becoming a Rehabilitation Professional. For that course, we have seminars, usually two hours each for about 12 weeks, and we teach between 40 and 80 students there. In other faculties and at postgraduate levels, we teach guest lectures or as part of, of courses that are existing um, courses. Across other faculties, we've increasingly starting to build and try and work out how to link health sciences and other faculties. And that's included the launching this year of a new MPhil in health and the arts. And the two most specific health related components of that are a course called the meat of the matter, which is about uh, basically flesh foods and planetary personal and systemic health and health disease and society. In terms of the staff, uh, we have myself, I have a full-time position and Sarah, who has a part-time position. So we essentially have one and kind of a half to two thirds, although in that way that happens in academia, Sarah often works more hours and gets less pay, um, but it's us two. And then we have a team of markers who assist us with the marking. And we have access to PBL facilitators who are responsible for kind of uh, directing the, the, the self-oriented learning that goes on in in problem-based learning groups so the the curriculum in terms of it, it's we try to stick to similar similar themes but because of the different natures of the way in which physiotherapy and medicine are taught they have to be to be some adjustments so if we look at the mbchb curricula the entire curriculum is is built around this idea of an integrated curriculum so all the disciplines and only some of them are, are listed here. I think last time I counted, there's about 17 different disciplines come together and work on a fictional case. So there is a, a, a somebody seeking health care um, and they and there's a story that students are given around around that person. So clearly a bit like the the kind of examples that you you write up for for the New England Journal of Medicine. Here the students are introduced to a person, and in each of those introductions, linked to the specific system, the the, the group is learning about. So it can be integumentary system, cardiac system, respiratory system. Um, the the learning outcomes and the key points that the different disciplines want the students to learn are woven into that story. In terms of what myself and Sarah do, we are interested in, in the semesters in power, privilege and intersecting identities, then in narratives and meanings of health and illness, and then also in notions of wellness and well-being. Now, what that means, and I'll speak primarily about semester three because this is the, the section I teach, um, Semester three is the kind of the very, very basic humanities light introduction. It's like the super diet version of humanities for health sciences education. So we started this with the idea that students need to have at the very least a basic understanding of some of the primary identities that construct not only who they are, but also who the patients are or the people are who are coming to them for health care. So we focus in this on race, class, gender, sexual orientation, and have increasingly been moving ability into it. And we also seek to provide students with really just an introduction to ideas and theories and experiences linked to intersectionality and to the notion of intersecting identities. We do this um, 
through thinking around things like the historical context of medicine and healthcare, historical consciousness, um, hegemonic systems and notions of race and scientific racism, globalization, and bring it sort of up to speed as it will by specifically addressing climate change and the climate crisis. Uh, we also are trying to champion unashamedly the need for the basic engagement with academic and critical literacy. So critical reading, critical thinking, critical analysis, which often receives a lot of pushback in a context where there is a very positivist approach to learning and those skills are not necessarily valued. They're seen as extraneous or, or unnecessary. And the other subject that we repeatedly bring to the fore is that there are multiple truths and ontologies and subjectivities in knowledge. So we find with a lot of students, there is a, sometimes not always, but an overarching idea of, of the, the truth of science and the, and the kind of vagary or unscientific nature of humanities or social sciences or the arts. So we spend some time speaking around those things. As an example of some of the, the topics and titles, uh, we talk about histories of medicine, race and science, knowledge systems, globalization, gender. We have in the past had um, people who have experienced specific types of, of, of health treatments. So we used to have a very lovely um, colleague who came and spoke about his heart transplant experience. Fortunately, he died due to COVID. So we haven't yet... Um, yeah, found somebody to replace him, and he was a remarkable person. Anyway, we talk about sexuality, the climate crisis. In physiotherapy, because we have a little more time and space, we can expand on some of those um, themes, and we can also allow students to do presentations because we have fewer students and, and more time. Central to those ideas are, so to just to give an example of what that looks like in terms of the MBCHB, each of these cases are particular people and they each have a certain a concern that the students need to engage with. And we try and build in the holistic and, and kind of biopsychosocial backgrounds or historical context that might be important um, to students to know about. As an example, the first case is a 22 year old medical student called Peter Fulhu and he's got a boil on his nose and he has an interest in reading and identity politics. And so you use that as the central basis around which to organize the other learning components. And what we try to do is to get students to think about whatever the system that they're engaging with in this case, in Peter's case, skin, as part of something more than just an integumentary system that needs to be understood as something that requires healing. And we do this by, by engaging with subjects that we do often get pushback and others have spoken about this, discussions about race and racism, sexism, homophobia, tend to provoke um, multiple responses. We try and expose students to different types of reading than writing um, as part of a, a kind of push towards the increasing demands that are going to be made on healthcare professionals to write for multiple fora. Uh, the other significant themes uh, that Sarah builds on, particularly in the context of violence being the fourth burden of disease in South Africa, are issues around structural violence, cycles of violence, and trauma-informed care, and what that means for people who are going to become healthcare professionals in South Africa. Outside of that set curricular space, the other spaces where we've had a chance for intervention is in the special studies modules. These are one month electives and students are meant to develop research skills and write a literature review. We've used this space in the directorate to do some of the more interesting um, work. So we've done photo voice projects, we've done yoga and health discussions, music and medicine, anatomy and drawing, drama and mental illness and health and writing. And some of the images I'm gonna show you here. So that image is, the haptic uh, drawing process to encourage students to improve and get a better sense of anatomy. Um, oh, no, I hate to interrupt you here, but we're, we're over time. Oh, okay. All right. I'll get to the challenges then. So uh, there's the postgraduate conventions. In terms of our allies and structures, the protests on campus have shaped how we've had to think about things, the curriculum transformation that's happening now. We have some resources, some are, uh, um, allies, but they are variable and changing institutional kind of interests and support. The challenges I think many have mentioned, there's practical things like timetables, uh, the actual content that go into curricula, what we refer to as the Marmite effect. Um, so people either love or hate the course. Um, there's often no into, into like, 
gray in between that country pedagogies and this idea of what are real subjects and what is real medicine, which often results in a siloing of knowledge and learning as opposed to shattering those ideas and building a collaborative, epistemically generous and epistemically curious phase of being. Um, there's, of course, increasing pressures on resources and the realities of what students have to face and see in the healthcare system in South Africa and their moments of success. Um, including students who say things like, your influence has been a trigger to me having a happier, queerer, and existentially more fruitful life. So amongst the challenges, there are also moments of success um, that we try and hold on to and that we try and make space for. Uh, we try and make space for these spaces of thinking around inclusion, access, and social justice, and epistemic generosity and collaboration. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. So I, I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to I'm going to move on to our, our next two speakers who have a joint presentation, Marco Ramos and Nathan Ha from Yale. But first, I'll just also say that please throw questions specific for uh, for Carla Sampiris into the Q&A and direct them to her in particular, and, and, and she can type in answers to them and we'll come back to them in the Q&A in general. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Ramos and Dr. Ha. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Really appreciate it. And um, really lovely to be here to share some about our work. Um, just to introduce myself, and I'll let Nathan introduce himself as well. Um, I am a psychiatry resident in my last year. Um, I also have a PhD in the history of medicine um, that I got here at Yale as well. And my own work fo focuses on health activism in Latin America. Um, but today we're here to talk about a curricular initiative that we've actually started not in a medical school, but in a psychiatry residency program. And we're going to talk, it's, it's a very new initiative, so I'm curious to hear people's thoughts, but we're going to talk um, some about the vision that inspired it and uh, the work that we do. Um, so just in terms of logistics, um, we call it just very simply the history of psychiatry track. And it's part of a larger um, uh, structure, uh, curricular structure in the Department of Psychiatry called the Social Justice and Health Equity Curriculum. Um, and our particular track in history is six two-hour lessons, and they're mandatory lessons that um, psychiatry residents participate in um, at different stages in their four-year training. Um, there are also three other tracks, and you can see them here. I'm happy to talk more about them, but they include structural competency, human experience, um, as well as advocacy. So we started the history of psychiatry curriculum two years ago with a particular vision, and that vision is that um, we need history in medical training, uh, particularly in psychiatry perhaps, because it can serve as a form of harm reduction, which I think has a lot of affinity with social medicine as a movement. Um, and as many of you know, harm reduction emerged historically in the 70s and 80s as an approach to substance use that rejected abstinence as the primary goal of addiction treatment. And instead, harm reduction focused on reducing the harm associated with substance use at multiple levels, at the level of biology, for example, through distribution of clean needles to IV injection drug users, and at social, political, and structural levels through activist attempts to abolish the racist policies of the ongoing war on drugs. So our belief was that teaching history could also serve as a form of harm reduction, and it could reduce the harm that's associated not with substance use, but with the practice of medicine itself, as an institution that is embedded in histories of white supremacy and colonization. So to put it another way, we believe it is irresponsible professionally to practice medicine without understanding the history of harm that our profession has inflicted on indigenous, black, Latinx, AEPI, LGBTQI, disability, and other marginalized communities. And without a, a historical understanding of this harm and how it continues to impact care today from disparities in access uh, to medical mistrust in certain communities, we believe that providers will consciously or not continue to perpetuate these harms in the name of care. So this is a sort of a, a more internal critical focus on the practice of medicine itself as opposed to looking at uh, inequities and in structures in society, though of course that works also very important. So for this talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss briefly how teaching history uh, can help reduce harm uh, to our patients. And then Dr. Ha will discuss how it reduces the harm that medical training inflicts on trainees, which is something that Kelly Knight mentioned, especially trainees with marginalized identities. 
So what does teaching as harm reduction mean for a classroom of health professionals? First, I think it, mean, it means moving beyond trite historical cases in our teaching, like the Tuskegee experiments or J. Marion Sims. Instead, in our curriculum, we always begin with clinical and personal experiences in the present and then work backwards to trace their history. And by starting with learners' experiences, we try to ensure that the lessons are relevant and engage with structures of, of oppression that continue to operate in medicine today. So for example, one lesson begins with racial disparities in psychiatry now, such as the fact that black men receive disproportionately high rates of schizophrenia diagnoses, or the fact that black people in mental health crisis, including children, are more likely to experience the violence of physical and chemical restraint when they're in the emergency room. In that lesson, we use the work of sociologist Jonathan Metzl and historian Carolyn Roberts to trace these disparities in psychiatry back to the 1970s, when American psychiatrists pathologized Black activism as psychosis, and even further back to slavery when African people were torn from their homelands and diagnosed by slave ship doctors with racial melancholia. In another lesson, we begin with our hospital formulary, which is the drugs that we are able to prescribe to our patients at Yale New Haven Hospital. We use the work of anthropologist Joe Dumit and historian David Healy, um, as well as Jeremy Green, to trace the massive influence of pharmaceutical capitalism on our mental health care system, from the hospital formulary and sponsorship of psychiatric conferences to the approval of drugs by the FDA. And our lesson on substance use leans on the work of historian Sam Roberts and of course, Helena Hansen, who's also here, to show how the criminalization of heroin users in black communities under Presidents Nixon and Reagan has contributed to a racist two-tier system of treatment. This system tends to prescribe office-based buprenorphine to white people and highly, highly regulated and stigmatized methadone to communities of color living in cities. So the goal of these, teaching this history is not simply academic, we teach them so that we can do better and so that we can collectively imagine new strategies and approaches for undoing the harm that we teach the history of. For example, partly inspired by our teaching, trainees at Yale have organized and advocated for tracking the rates of schizophrenia diagnosis and physical restraint on our inpatient services. And we're exploring how historical racial disparities in diagnosis and treatment are actually playing out in our local clinical settings. Led by fellow uh, psychiatry resident Neantara Anderson, trainees have also developed a feedback system where residents, nurses, patients, and supervisors can report instances of discrimination and hate. And there is st still obviously enormous work to do on this front, particularly in our local setting uh, at Yale, but history serves as a critical tool, we believe, for understanding the depth and scope of injustice in our local settings and for imagining solutions to address it. And now I'll pass it over to Nathan, who's going to discuss uh, the impact of our curriculum on trainings. Well, thank you again, everyone, so much for inviting us. Um, so I'm I'm uh, Nathan, and um, I'm also a fourth year resident in my last year of training in, in the psychiatry department here at Yale. Um, uh, my PhD is also in the history of science and medicine, and, and my uh, research was on the discovery of the X and Y chromosomes and hormones and how that affected the treatment of sexual and gender minorities. Um, <clears throat> I'm thrilled to be with, uh, here with you today, so I'd just like to continue with the second part of our presentation, um, which is, as Marco mentioned, um, he and I have taught the history of medicine as a, as a harm reduction approach that has two prongs, right? To address harms inflicted on patients, as well as those inflicted on providers. Um, and there is actually a vast body of literature demonstrating the exploitation, abuse, and harassment um, endured by trainees as they go through the arduous decade-long process of medical education. Uh, just to cite two examples, depression rates in trainees is as high as um, 60 to 70 percent, and physician burnout rates approach uh, nearly 50 percent in the United States. And as residents ourselves, um, we also witness daily patient encounters and um, didactics that recapitulated a multi-directional barrage of harm. Um, supervisors, nursing staff, other healthcare workers, patients and their families mistreated trainees, and trainees also participated in a system that normalized enactments of injustice uh, on patients as routine. So we and our peers, for example, have been told that enduring racist abuse will teach us how to treat difficult patients in the future better, and to toughen up when we protested a disproportionate physical and chemical restraining of black and brown children in hospital settings. 
these experiences have been especially distressing for many trainees who identify with marginalized groups marked by differences of race, gender, sexuality, class, or disability. Um, so I want to point out that we've built upon the work of trailblazing clinician historians, including David Jones and Jeremy Green, <coughs> who are uh, with us here today, who have argued that history is an essential component of medical knowledge, reasoning, and practice. And we believe um, that there's also an additional benefit of learning history for medical trainings. History could teach medical residents not only how to be better doctors, but also to reflect critically on what it means to be a doctor. And we did not want to return to debates about professionalization and whether history should either inculcate pride in a noble calling or train future citizen activists. Instead, we envision teaching history as a style of thought that doctors could deploy in their everyday practice to better understanding uh, the health and suffering of patients alongside their own suffering. So the project of us translating history to medicine and practicing history in medicine has been really labor intensive, not only intellectually, but also emotionally and politically as well. And highly emotional topics, such as the participation of doctors um, in the transatlantic slave trade and the pathologization of sexuality took center stage in our lesson, for example, on diagnosis. And we made time to process the emotions that came up for learners. History became a mirror for them to reflect upon their own difficult experiences in the clinic and affect became a way for them to consolidate their own learning. Learners reflected on the moral injury of forcibly discharging homeless patients without adequate care, repeatedly back to the streets, and of fighting racist consults from colleagues and nurses who wanted psychiatrists to justify the restraint of people of color deemed to be agitated. At the end of our lesson on diagnosis, which featured a quote from the Gay Liberation Front linking the civil rights, feminist, and LGBTQ movements, a resident connected their own mental health frustrations with those of their patients. They wrote, maybe we should think about how diagnosis reflects social norms. My patients tell me di diagnosis won't help them get a job, keep me out of jail, or fix my car when those are the bigger problems in their lives. And it's a, a solution. One of our, <coughs> our co-residents suggested that diagnosis should involve a process of informed consent. And one shared at the end, this is the most validating, encouraging, grounding, and frankly, therapeutic couple of hours I've had since the start of the pandemic. Thank you so much for this. So similarly, during our lesson on substance abuse, learners reflected on the harms they and their patients experienced reflecting on the extra labor that they have to engage in to get patients access to methadone, for example, some reflected on the injustice uh, <clears throat> uh, that this process created, especially for black patients, and shared, I'm having a hell of a day from dealing with these issues. I think we and our patients are sometimes stuck in one perspective, clinical, legal, and I don't know why we got there and why it has been so frustrating. Having this historical perspective today helps us to contextualize it better and maybe help our patients more as well. In conclusion, the harms that our healthcare system inflicts on both patients and pr practitioners is relentless. And healthcare professionals often do not have the historical or social scientific knowledge to help them understand the sources of these harms or to pinpoint the structural forces that mass systemic issues as individual ones in the first place. However, our curriculum has shown that history can teach trainees to appreciate how interactions with patients have been shaped by developments far beyond the walls of the clinic. By helping healers to engage in constructive self-critique of their daily practices and the systems in which they work, history and the social sciences can not only help trainees to survive the training process, it can also help them to imagine new forms of practicing that are less about doing things to patients and more about healing with them. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Thanks so much, Nathan and, and Marco. We still have a few minutes. Um, if folks have questions specifically for the two of you and the model that you've presented here, um, please uh, please put them into the Q and A. And there's an opportunity to ask them in front of everybody right now. Um, I'll give that a moment, just in, in case. Uh, sorry, I, I realize that you can't see me even. My my internet's been 
the, the lights have been going up and down here with the power drain from air conditioning. Um, but uh, you know, for those of you who need a little bit of time to get your fingers going to type in a question. Um, but if not, um, you know, you can still type them in, and I'll I'll uh, turn the stage over to uh, our, our 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 anchor presenter for the day, uh, Dr. Barry Saunders from the Department of Social Medicine at the University of North Carolina, um, uh, Chapel Hill. Um, so so Barry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone, for hosting this and inviting me to uh, share some thoughts with you. Um, I am a, an anthropologist of biomedicine and a former ER doc. Uh, I've been teaching in social medicine at UNC since uh, 1992. Oh, Barry, I think the you microphone is muted, speak. Barry. Yeah, it has to happen at least once during any webinar. I'm so sorry. All right, I'm not sure where it happened, but uh, I'm in the Department of Social Medicine, which serves up to preclinical medical students, a curriculum that addresses social and cultural aspects of health, uh, healthcare choices, and institutional cultures, uh, clinical ethics, little research ethics, and basic healthcare economics and policy in the US. The curriculum spans three semesters. It's referred to as social and health systems. It's taught in a seminar format by an interdisciplinary faculty whose members are trained in humanities, social sciences, uh, or clinical medicine, public health. The first two semesters of SHS are a survey, intro to basic concepts and broad contexts, uh, uh, mostly through discussion of shared readings. A third of the readings come from our social medicine reader. These are supplemented by other readings, podcasts, videos that change uh, uh, each year. Weekly topics flow in a, a layered sequence. The layering changes each year a little bit. Two thirds of the faculty hail from the social medicine department. The rest are chosen uh, clinical colleagues with advanced training in or affinities with humanities, social science, or public health. Every faculty member apprentices for a year before, me, before assuming a solo instructor role. And the faculty also meets before each session to discuss pedagogical strategies. So in instructing each other, we move from our multidisciplinary um, formation toward an interdisciplinary commons. The third semester of SHS is a deeper dive into a particular topic or approach. Each instructor teaches from particular interest or expertise. Uh, each semester of study in this foundation phase comprises about 20 contact hours in groups of 12 to 15 students across a 13, 14 week semester. Uh, the students are evaluated based on verbal participation in discussions, presentations, and short focus papers, no exams. Um, this arrangement, of preclinical coursework has been in place for decades, really. Nine years ago, a wave of curriculum revision followed an accreditation review by the LCME. Changes that unfolded are not unique to UNC, but are, uh, I think, typical of secular trends in US medical education. There were changes in the administrative control of the curriculum, a new objectification of student competencies, and streamlining of the preclinical curriculum from four semesters to three to each of these briefly. Uh, decisions about curriculum content were removed from departments and assigned to a central committee. So disciplinary courses like anatomy, physiology, biochemistry were dissolved and replaced by organ system science blocks. In this shift, our social med course did manage to maintain its contours, though it was touch and go for a bit. Our departmental origins were something of a downside, uh, but our address of a social system analogous to an organ system was a plus. Now the SHS course directors formally report to the education dean, no longer the social medicine chair. We work constantly to explain and justify uh, course structure to stakeholder colleagues who do not always understand the principles, textures, or topical content of social medicine teaching. 
winds of curriculum fashion get spun into little vortices of demand and contention. Uh, competencies. Some of the sorts of intellectual capacities and habits our courses engage, reflexivity, equipoise, critique, judgment, are poor fits with at least some construals of the category of competency. They're capacities that require longer apprenticeships, not see one, do one, teach one, and not easily captured in multiple choice tests. Yes, there are facts and skills we need our students to master. We are uh, huge fans of the work of Helena and others on uh, structural competency, but we're concerned too with trainees' intellectual postures in a world where tools and knowledge change fast. We repeat a joke, you all know, don't just do something, stand there. So our relation to competencies, which now have doctrinal status, is sometimes a little fraught. Uh, with the attenuation of preclinical training, mostly you know sci sciences, the curricular footprint for social medicine was initially reduced, but only slightly, not so uh, severely as that of the biosciences. This produced, unfortunately, some collegial tensions and misunderstandings. But there was also renewed attention to the timing of the social medicine. Uh, teaching across the curriculum. In general, and maybe surprisingly, the social medicine footprint construed broadly expanded, most, mostly into clinical training the last two years. A lot of that growth has been led by clinic, clinician colleagues who are more contingently related to the Department of Social Medicine. This makes coordination more complicated. Uh, there is an SHS-4 course for third-year students and an SHS-5 course for fourth year students that involve clinically relevant social medicine concerns. Um, at the bottom of this slide, there's a scholarly concentration in humanities and social sciences, which makes heavy use of individualized electives mentored by social medicine faculty. About this course name, SHS, uh, nine years ago, our preclinical course's name was changed from medicine and society to professional development, kind of as a condition of course survival. Um, and then five years ago, it was changed again to social and health systems. This time, a kind of a compromise struck in the fairly stiff breezes of health system science that are blowing from AMA Education Consortia. About health system science, uh, clinician educators at UNC lately returned from AAMC and AMA Education Conferences inspired to offer more and better teaching of health system sciences. The central impetus here, or one of them is, that physicians can't fly solo anymore. Uh, they need to be more involved in teams and institutional matters of safety, quality, delivery of high value care. This has motivated some of the curricular interventions in the previous slide. Uh, some of my colleagues though, don't recognize how much health system science material is already present or prepared for in the social medicine curriculum we've been teaching for decades like social determinants, health of populations, financing, policy. So there's a new wineskin problem, some misrecognition. A second issue though is about thought styles. The health system science textbook serves up material in a fairly presentist, positivist, and often insufficiently critical mode in its efforts to yoke physicians more tightly to organizational priorities. Uh, I think maybe embrace of the term science led the AMA toward packaging that resembles packaging of other science knowledge, just factoids ripped out of time. Um, our departmental habit is to ask why, to reprise historical contexts, to interrogate concepts. So while health system science is a promising vessel for social medicine perspectives, it comes with issues, at least so far. A few other tractions on our social medicine curriculum. Uh, UNC's ticket to a recent med ed consortium was a new curriculum in leadership. So modules on leadership were shoehorned into the SHS course. We're still working out how to make these fit. The leadership framework came partly from collaborations with the business school and models of organizational psychology that involve trademarks. We're not sure how to square leadership with the physician's occupational hazard of arrogance. We're a bit more comfortable with the notion of teamwork um, and we may wind up spinning this into discussion of interprofessional, interspecialty relations in clinical cultures. 
A second and very important traction that some of you have already talked about comes from the passions of students, including angst and indignation about racism, sexism, heteronormativity, and a, a burning planet. The press to honor diverse student identities and vulnerabilities has become pretty intense. Following student demands, several hours of lectures were recently added to clinical skills courses in each term of the uh, foundation phase to teach first person language, gender affirming language, anti racist advocacy gestures, open charting, just a range of approaches to inclusivity in the clinic. Um, there was little coordination with the SHS course in this move. So a little bit of a left hand, right hand problem. These skills approaches were also pragmatic, so not all sufficiently hinged to history or critiques of colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy. Um, while student passions have resulted in some additions to the curriculum, they also make teaching complicated, even for those of us who do this uh, frequently and, and directly. Um, I was chastened last fall in conducting a lecture hall discussion uh, for the neuro course of the stroke belt in the US, this regional uh, disparity that also has a racial, racialized aspect. When I showed this slide here in, um, from a published paper, a, a map of current stroke mortality alongside this map of, of uh, 1860 slave ownership, students were triggered. And now the neuro course directors are reluctant to conduct this session again. A third traction comes from high stakes standardized national exams, particularly step one, which the UNC students now take in their uh, second year spring. Because student performance on this exam fell off in our organ system curriculum shift, there was a push to eliminate noise that might distract from testable signal. So a curriculum that I've been working on a lot to serve up some STS, science technology society uh, perspectives in each organ system block, um, got summarily scrapped, right, noise. On the other hand, the step one exam is itself gradually including more content that we recognize as part of the social medicine space. Um, this is a good thing, though early rounds of question writing seem clunky in places. Um, we're wary of having to teach to a test um, or being asked to use multiple choice exams in our own course. Uh, you and, uh, but, um, also standardized tests beget standardized uh, commercial prep materials. So, uh, UNC is already importing plenty of these materials directly into its teaching, uh, not in SHS, but elsewhere. For instance, RX Bricks, pictured here, published by the USMLE, began as shuffleable science modules. Um, now RX Bricks that address social medicine content areas are being published uh, as we speak, um, and some are in the works. Uh, last slide here, UNC is facing another curriculum watershed. Uh, two demands are gonna change how our social medicine content gets packaged. The first is for better integration with science content and with clinical um, cases and clinical skills. The logistics here get complicated uh, the internal logics of the SHS course and our deliberate layering of concepts now needs to mesh with a series of teaching cases built by clinicians um, who don't know the SHS course and may not have adequate opportunity to interface with us. So cases that glancingly involve say race or homelessness or decisional capacity or insurance status are gonna be scheduled in service to science topics in and out of sync with the seminars in which we address these concepts patiently and thoughtfully. The second demand is that we scrap our uh, third semester freestanding SHS seminars and replace them with a seminar course built around a common syllabus. Uh, this change is one that my departmental colleagues are mourning. These topical seminars have been uh, it, 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 uh, for over for decades, a source of professional fulfillment and extremely popular with students. On the other hand, this new common syllabus that's in development is an opportunity for us to address with all the students some topics that we have never taught before. Um, I, I will have a chance to think about many of the topical areas that you suggested today. Um, we anticipate, among other things, some globalizing, some public health ethics, some interfaces of medicine and law, some economics and policy frameworks that um, are outside the US. So 
thanks. Um, I realize I'm the caboose. I, I'm really thrilled to be part of this excellent conversation today about social medicine topics that are vital to the formation of medical students. Thanks so much, Barry. And thank you to all of our presenters so far. You've given us so much to think about, both in terms of threads that connect um, and, the, and also the factors and forces and even terms that differentiate um, what it is that we're talking about when we talk about teaching social medicine and medical education. Um, I do want to point out we've been going strong for two hours. Um, I feel that it's important to give everyone a few minutes break. I mean, we can pretend that we're all just two dimensional objects here, but we do still have bodies. And I'm thinking if we take five minutes, we might come back to uh, even more reinvigorated for a panel discussion. So again, a five minute break, which is basically to say at 15 minutes past the hour, we're gonna start up for a panel discussion across all of these discussions, in which case we're also gonna open the floor widely to participants for a question and answer. So take a break, stick around. We'll see you at 15 past. Come with us, those of you who are still here. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I wanna open up to the, really this panel discussion in, in two parts once we have everyone um, who spoke uh, be become visible. Um, and I'd say the first part is really, um, I think responding to some of the questions that were put out even in the very beginning by, uh, by this you know, really engaged audience um, that we've had. Um, and that is to look at questions of, you know, what, what are the forms of commonality and what are the forms of difference that emerge in these remarkable presentations of really dedicated, engaged work happening in peer institutions in very different contexts? And I guess one of the fundamental questions, which I saw a couple of the Q&A questions oriented towards, um, was really uh, this question of whether there was um, one coherent thing that was or is social medicine across all of these contexts. Um, and not, not that social medicine needs to have a particular definition, but and to ask about what are, the, what are the differences when we find ourselves speaking of um, you know, community diagnosis, as Junji Haruta mentions, um, you know, Saude Colectiva, as Kenneth Camargo mentions, structural competency, um, harm reduction, social justice, health equity. Um, we, we, there's a clustering space here, but asking the question, what, 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 do you, what you see of as, as the commonalities in this space? Um, and then I guess the other pieces, I'm just very interested in having some of the panelists speak to each other in terms of what you notice of differences, both in terms of enviable differences, you know, oh, I wish that I and my institution had the support that you're framing in this X, right? Or in sort of sympathetic differences of, wow, like what are the challenges of building social medicine without having Y or Z? And what kind of bridges might we be able to even offer each other um, given the kind of lumpiness of what kinds of, what kinds of resources and lack of resources we have, which don't seem to all match up in this project of placing social medicine in the curriculum. So I wanted to open up this question to the panel, but also to, you know, as we warm up into this, to actually um, ask uh, two of my uh, co-panelists here to also introduce themselves. Um, and that's uh, Francisco Ortega and Chinko Kitanaka. Um, Francisco, would you mind starting and introducing yourself and perhaps offering a bit of comment on this question? Uh, yes, hello. Uh... My name is Francisco Ortega. I am research professor at the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Study in Barcelona and at the Medical Anthropology Research Center at the University of Tarragona. But previously, I was more than 20 years colleague of Kenneth Camargo at the Institute for Social Medicine. And I also had the spirit where he is missed dearly. <laughs> I also have the experience of teaching of teaching uh, uh, for medical students, which was a, a very rewarding experience. But we also had some challenge. And one, one thing that I don't know if, if Kenneth mentioned is that 
uh, many times uh, those courses are not elect, uh, are not mandatory, but they, but they are elected courses. So we have several times we have the problem that you know the students have to choose between social medicine and I don't know medical in, uh, uh, informatics or something like that, and they prefer uh, they uh, they they seldom choose uh, social medicine. So we have very very few students. That was one of the one of the things, but. But it was uh, uh, very important, and also because I think, and that's something I, I have I have been seeing the the, the comments on 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 the Q and A uh, questions and answers regarding the similarities between uh, Saudi Colectiva or Latin American social medicine and and U.S. social medicine, etc. And I think one interesting thing that 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 we we share or in, in Brazil and in the U.S. is this this parity being on, on the one hand very. Uh, uh, huge health inequalities in the country and the medical the medical uh, uh, students who are very unaware of those inequalities because they normally become for very for very uh, uh, rich backgrounds and and, and they they, ha they don't have the experience of dealing with this this inequality so that that makes the whole thing a challenge although they they have the the, the the inequalities in front of their faces so they are not living in in a, in a countries that are more unequal so that is something that is very challenging and and and, and is is really uh, i think one one wants a commonality between those those two countries I don't know if Junko wants to add something. Yes, uh, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks, Francisco. Now, I like to really thank all the speakers. I've, I've been learning a lot, and I've been getting emails from my Japanese colleagues about how much they've already learned. Um, medical anthropology, I'm a medical anthropologist um, who teaches at Keio University in Tokyo. Um, and the medical anthropology and medical sociology have become part of the official medical school curriculum in Japan about five years ago, I think. So there could be questions about, you know, our discipline in the national exam, uh, which is great. And I've been really enjoying teaching my medical students um, at Keio. And they are incredibly smart. And uh, we start out giving them like a cartoon, like manga thing with a few uh, captions made into blank. And it's actually a manga about um, atomic bomb survivors. But you don't know that by just looking at that. And you kind of have to guess from the background and from the conversations that are going on. Um, and so you have to imagine what the woman actually said to the other person. And, and so it's kind of like a discovery process for the students. And that kind of shocks them. Um, because they realize how little they know about, you know, the possible patient that they could be seeing, for instance. And we also do things like um, thinking about actually looking at a medical chart from the 1950s about a woman who became possessed with a fox um, written by a psychiatrist. It's actually the actual medical record. And, and then think about, you know, what was going on and what we can do to intervene um, in this particular case. And it, it's really fascinating because um, as medical students try to sort of place their own mind in that woman's, you know, what was going through that woman's um, mind at the time, they, they really begin to realize how little they know. And what was really striking at the time that I, that we did a, um, sort of a performance uh, about uh, circumcision, we, we learned about it and each person was given a role of um, like a village uh, therapist, a school teacher, MD, the mother of the girl who's gonna go through that, a father, and each one had to do their own research about you know, what could be the possible reasons for and against conducting that. And they enacted these roles and they really like sort of put their mind into it. And it was really sort of interesting how they were able to see from very different perspectives. So we've been having a lot of fun with these. But as I listened to the presentations today, I realized that uh, maybe you're not really dealing with so much with social inequality in real life. We're sort of trying, to, we're doing a lot to cultivate medical students' imagination and get them interested in those social perspectives. And I think it's really working. Um, but what I really got out, uh, for instance, from uh, Marco's and Nathan's presentation was the idea that medicine could actually hurt patients. 
And I think this is the point that's beautifully illustrated in Tanya Larman's book, um, uh, the ethno that's really an ethnography of psychiatric residency. So in that book, he, she describes how um, resident psychiatric residents uh, who go through sort of bio more biomedicalized training begin to learn how patients can hurt them because you know they <laughs> might demand for a bed um, and then you know keep residents sleepless. But when they go through the psychotherapeutic training, they begin to realize how their own words can hurt the patients, um, how you know whatever. Um, not intentionally, they can be really sort of damaging patients in so many ways. And I, I, re I, I really was moved by Marcos and Nathan's presentations about how they themselves felt vulnerable um, by going through these trainings and seeing what happens in actual medical practice on a daily basis when medicine that's really supposed to be about healing actually does damage. And I think that's a sort of a common theme across all the presentations. Um, about teaching students how to be sensitive so that they don't do harm. Um, and at the same time, I kept wondering, you know, this is so wonderful that people can be so sensitive and, and, and um, open to the idea that they can be vulnerable and empathetic in that way. But at the same time, I can see how scary and even traumatic that is to sort of expose yourself in that way. And I can see that being resisted by you know, students who don't want to go there. So I kind of want to raise that question to all of you, perhaps, um, about how you go beyond that resistance and how you work with them so you don't do even more harm. Thanks. Thanks so much to both of you. And I'd, I'd like to open this up now for, um, for, for panel's reflections on, on both those questions and other things that came up as you found yourself listening to each other's presentations in this space. And then we'll open it up for a general Q&A. I, I, I just, uh, first of all, uh, part, make a clarification of something that Francisco just said, is that we were in two different uh, courses. Uh, and in fact, all, all the, the, the things that I mentioned are the mandatory courses that we have with the medical students. But we also offer two uh, other uh, optional disciplines. One that Francisco was involved in, was involved in the past as well, a long way back. And the other one is offered to all the students in, in general. I, I think all, every, every student that is related to biomedical subjects, uh, which is on bioethics. But unfortunately, we have this problem that Francisco just mentioned. First of all, because most of the, the medical courses consist of mandatory disciplines. So the, the slots that they have in the curriculum for optional things is very limited. And we have a very stark competition from other things. I, I think the general theme uh, and, and something that uh, Barry I think, and, and David some, um, addressed it to me in, in, in the chat, is I think it's a commonality that we, we are on, on, on the underdog side. Uh, what, what we are trying to, to teach and getting the attention of students uh, is it's not, unfortunately, the, the mainstream of medical thought. And the students, are, we have to acknowledge that they are subjected to a, a lot of pressure that be it licensing exams or in our case, uh, residency programs that as they end medical school, most of them intend to enter into residency programs and the exams to get into a residency program are very, very hard, lots of competition as well. And of course, this kind of question is not amenable how do you, do you put all this kind of content that we're discussing into a sort of multiple choice test or so? And so there is a lot of pressure to, to make them fit into the mold. And I think there is something that we have to contend a, a lot. On the other hand, I see that uh, there are some institutional advantages and disadvantages. Uh, on the one hand, we have a fixed uh, faculty. So uh, we don't have to rely on the goodwill of anyone for teaching. The, our colleagues are, are, are is part of our work anyway, and we have uh, uh, a lot of time for that. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that we are in a different institution from the medical school, uh, sometimes complicated things in, 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 in a lot of different ways. I had an experience a long time ago while I was a, a postdoctoral fellow at McGill, and they have a department of social studies of medicine that is part of the medical school and the arts faculty at the same time. 
And that was an interesting arrangement. And they had, a, I don't know what it's like now, but they had a discipline at the end of medical school that was called medical judgment, which was very interesting, it had a lot of contents related to medical anthropology. But the problem is they placed at the end of the curriculum, basically because that's the time when the students are flying around trying to find places in residency programs. So we are always contending with this kind of competition from the more uh, hardcore medical stuff, I think. Um, yeah, I, um, I really appreciate that, um, uh, <laughs> Kenneth, and I can really identify uh, with that. I mean, at UCSF, our experience is interesting because we have a little bit of a bifurcation where um, there's some groups of students that feel like the social medicine is the most important curriculum. And so they're disgruntled and upset that it hasn't evolved in a way. Um, and I think that those are really legitimate um, critiques, um, as I as I pointed out in my talk, and part of, you know, reform and, and efforts that we're taking now to, to improve things. And then another group of students, um, you know, as, as I think David alluded to in his talk that that don't necessarily value and others that don't necessarily value the, the content and and then the and then the message to faculty is to teach to everyone and have something that um, that will work for everybody. So you know one of the things that that we are exploring that's in its very much infancy is is more of an affinity based learning structure at UCSF um, as one um, and I think we could talk a lot about that pedagogically. It's certainly not a resolved issue here, um, but it's something that's in an active discussion um, as one way to to respond not only to to interest and investment in the content, but also to experience, lived experience, um, and, and other forms of experience that, that our very diverse student body are bringing to UCSF, um, and ways in which the curriculum um, is a mismatch to where they need, where they sort of need the conversation to go. Um, and so we're trying to be really creative and open to figure out how how to, how to manage that. Um, I wanted to just say also briefly to Junko to your point about, um, about um, students experiencing trauma as a result of the curriculum and, and also as a result of their sort of indoctrination into the field of medicine and the recognitions of what medicine has historically been, you know, complicit or actively engaged in in relationship to, to, to causing harm. And, um, and that's, that's also something that that we have uh, are thinking a lot about amongst many others on the call um, have mentioned it and one of the things that we've done in a, in a sort of a really um, a particular way in the um, anti-oppressive curricular initiative or the OACI is to help faculty work with how they're presenting the the sort of the the, the potentially traumatizing uh, statistics around racialized health disparities, for example, um, and rather than just presenting the, the sort of the so-called facts of the structural violence of, of medicine and society, also extending that to provide um, uh, cross counter narratives, uh, organizations and people who are working uh, to actively um, imagine a different um, future and reality. So the students aren't just left with the facts as if those are intractable um, rather than, than highly, actually highly changeable uh, factors. Um, so that's just some of the, the work that we've done in a really kind of more detailed way that I think has been helpful to the faculty to really push them to, uh, to have some accountability to not just present the sort of the, 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 the terrible story of US healthcare and medicine, which we all know is, is, a, really, is a really terrible story. One of the things we've struggled with is that question of affinity groups within the course. I mean, currently, you know, we we offer the course to 200 first years and then 140 third or fourth years, and everyone is offered the same thing. Students are assumed seem to be at the same level, but there is a chunk of students. I'm not sure whether it's 10 or 20 percent uh, who have had su substantial experiences, either in the four year college before medical school or between college and medical school, and they feel like they've come into the course. Uh, with a lot of experience in history or anthropology or global health, and they want something different. Uh, and so they've said, no, what you should do is you should uh, partition the class and allow people who are interested in the material to opt in to a special advanced seminar and then leave everyone else who's not interested uh, in the rest of the class. Uh, and that hasn't been an exciting proposition for faculty because who wants to get assigned to teach students who have already actively identified themselves as uninterested in the material? Uh, and we're worried about the pernicious effects that would have. 
Uh, you, know, you can imagine doing the same thing in anatomy. So there's a lot of people would say they're not interested in anatomy either. Uh, and But the anatomy course would never uh, consider doing such a thing. And then the, the surprising one we got, and again, this reflects the ways in which, uh, especially over the past two years, in the setting of Black Lives Matter and COVID and everything else, a lot of students are feeling very vulnerable. Uh, and the word they often use in the course of evaluations is us is that they're traumatized. Uh, by discussions. They're traumatized by hearing the remarks of their classmates. <clears throat> so we had, we were approached by, you know, a delegation of, of Black students who said they think that the sections on race and racism should essentially be segregated. The, the, the 16 or 20 of them should be able to have their own class where they don't have to listen to their white classmates carrying on about racism. Uh, and then we could have a separate discussion for White people. And again, I'm totally sympathetic with the, the sentiment behind that. But kind of pedagogically, that just feels like a terrible idea to me. Uh, and because you know, the question is like, you know, where, where would the partition end? Uh, and would you have to like re scramble the class on every topic? Like when you go into gender, gender issues, do you resegregate the class? And you do disability, do you resegregate the class? And what do you do about aspects of identity and personal experience that aren't easily marked or segregated in that way? Um, and so, you know, we go back and forth and you're trying to have a conversation with the students about, we respect their feelings, but we think what they're proposing is a terrible idea. And that of course makes them feel disrespected. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out how to make progress with that question. I'm, I'm just really enjoying this discussion and um, thank everybody for these such thoughtful reflections, um, particularly on emotion and affect, because like in the chat, we were talking about how we all have bodies. And I also often think with Nathan about how we all have emotions as well. And I'm really, I think in a lot of ways, this work starts there. It starts with the sort of affect and emotions that ha people have around these issues, which can be really complicated. But the solution, as all of you are saying, the solution I don't think is to avoid that work. It's instead, and pretend it doesn't exist, it's instead to sort of frame the work as oriented towards that. And one strategy that, and this is, again, as everybody has said, these are all approaches, right? There's no recipe for this kind of work. But one strategy that I, I, I think I believe in, and I won't speak for Nathan, but um, comes up a lot in our work is foregrounding our own positionality with respect to the material that we're teaching. So like what identities and interests and emotions am I bringing as Marco to the lessons that I'm teaching? And that sets a stage for people immediately to begin thinking about how their identities and positions intersect with the material that we're discussing and letting people know that that's that is the discussion right like that's that's the project right this is not the point of this is not to sort of wallow in statistics about how people of color die more frequently than privileged groups it's to really sort of talk about what that means for us as people for us as people who are getting professionalized in the system that has this history of harm how does that make us feel as someone who has affinity with marginalized groups also, how does it make us feel as people who have identities that align with more privileged groups? And that's often what happens in these discussions is people will, people in our discussions will say like, as a white person, I'm having trouble entering this conversation or knowing what to say. Um, and these dynamics will come up, but I, I, I sympathize with what David was saying because in some ways that feels like the work, these tensions feel like the work and sort of segregating the conversations feels like it would um, not do that, um, though there may be a place in, in certain local contexts for segregating conversations if it's like gets to be particularly toxic, I can imagine that. But anyway, that, that was I, more I'm saying, I think one strategy for this that, that we've thought about is sort of foregrounding ourselves and foregrounding who we are as a way for opening that conversation up for, for the learners. Thank you, Marco. Um, <clears throat> So one commonality that I think has come across in these talks is that we all are working against the grain of mainstream biomedicine in one way or the other, which puts us at odds with all of the institutional ethos and structure that we have to work within. Um, and so part of our job has been 
in essence, to change the institution <laughs> and to change what counts as knowledge and legitimate practice. And that's a really tall order. And in order to accomplish that, I think each of us has had to build a, a base of support and almost demonstrate in the way that we do our work, political action within medicine. You know, I just looked up the quote from Rudolf Virko that we often see in social medicine classrooms, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing but medicine on a large scale. Um, so that from 1848 being our crying call, we're, we're in the awkward position of exposing the political nature of, of medicine um, in a field that works very hard to hide its tracks, you know, the objectivity and neutrality and um, which, hides a lot of very damaging dynamics within mainstream medicine. So we, we have this very tall order to work against the grain and to um, kind of explode medicine from the inside. But another thing that I've heard in these presentations is different generational dynamics. It, it sounds as though in Brazil, for example, there are many cohorts of students for whom this is a new way of thinking and, and working and it's really a lot of uh, pressure on the social medicine faculty to expose them and demonstrate how relevant social medicine and a critical perspective at that is on medicine. In the US, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it very often, actually I was involved with colleagues in doing a study of psychiatry residency programs across the country that had this kind of curriculum. And we found that almost all of the curricula in what we might call social psychiatry was started by people who were trainees at the time. They were residents, they were students, and they fought to get it taught and ended up teaching it as a trainee or student uh, rather than the other way around. And we called that the trickle up effect, you know, that they, they really had as students and trainees to take the lead in changing the paradigm. And what I see in many medical schools in the US is that we do have medical students who are entering with health justice background and more, tra more training in social medicine than many of their professors. Um, and I, I hope I don't put you on the spot, Marco, that I, I know that you started work on a health justice curriculum as a student, and then you are um, just about to finish residency, but I don't know how highlighted it was that you worked on this curriculum and Nathan worked on this curriculum as residents. So that, it seems, is a very successful model, uh, even to this point of students or trainees who are resistant. Um, I think it, it's actually very worthwhile for students and trainees to be involved as leaders in curriculum development because they bring all of their knowledge and expertise to bear rather than complaining about what's there. Um, and also they are enacting structural change you know, within the institution. So it, it, we have this tricky role of, su of supporting institutional change. Um, and I think that uh, bringing in trainees and students as partners in that and kind of pulling back the curtain on how this works could actually be a good thing. Kelly Knight has a lot of experience in building um, collaborative relationships among faculty and students who are social medicine oriented and even wrote about it in the, the book that I circulated a PDF of, but that's the political nature of the work we're doing. No, we're actually, we're working against the ethos of mainstream medical training. So it's a political project. And so how to sustain that as a movement. So thanks for that, Helena. And I know that Carla has a comment. Um, um, before moving on, I wanna encourage the audience right now to raise your hand. Um, we would love to hear your questions as part of this. And I think I figured out the button where we can actually allow you to have a voice in actually raising your question by yourself. But if not, I can ventriloquize uh, your question for the panel. But please start throwing your questions in as well. Raise your hand. Carla, your comment. Thank you. Um, just a few things. I mean, the one thing that, that strikes me is that we're talking about social medicine and, and its complexities and its functions at multiple levels. So for many of the people here, there's clearly a love, a, an interest, a, a commitment to education, to what you know it means to educate a generation of, of, of people. But there's also you know, the functions that these courses or these 
components have within our universities. So for some faculties I've seen in the questions, people saying, well, you know, it looks good for your university if you can say this. So, you know, there's the course that is around the ratings or the markings or the metrics, or whatever other nonsense is going on in that section. Then there's, you know, the course that is of interest to people who are genuinely interested in what it means to have conversations around health and health in, in, a, in a new way, in, in a different way. Um, in thinking about, um, you know, what it might look like to imagine healthcare differently and outside of the current, you know, structures and structures that we have on it. And then you have, you know, the added burdens of the pressures increasingly of throughput rates and not failing students. And, you know, so even if you wanted to be bold and say, well, if only 50 out of 150 students want to come to my course, well, so be it, then those 50, like I'll teach for them and the other 100 can take a flying leap. And that's not actually an option because they are the power structures of our careers and the way universities work in them. So I think there's, there's, there's this question of, we talk about social medicine or if we talk about medical health humanities or whatever else, it's, it's you know, which component part of it? Because doing work, at, you know, Helena, as you talk about, at these kind of spaces often of, of discomfort or unease, comes with, it comes with cost. And, and circling that back to Jungo, your point about, you know, vulnerabilities and emotions and traumas. And it's interesting for me, there's, there's been a, a, you know, significant uh, concerns recently around mental health issues among students and what students find comforting or discomforting in, in education, and yet not necessarily the same amount of emphasis on the impact of staff. And so, well, you know, what is it like when you are, and, and I raised because the very first conversation I ever went to when I just got this job was in, was in Europe. And a person who had spent 26 years of her life building a social medicine curricula had become dean. Six months after she left, it was gone. And she said, you know, I look back and, and for that moment I was there, it was there and then like that it was gone. And so there's also the question of what does it mean to, to have to also raise the difficult questions like racism, like sexism, like homophobia, often in contexts where our faculties are not necessarily interested in pursuing those as, as kind of areas that need research and deep thought, but as a quick fix. So we had situations on our, our campus during fees must fall and roads must fall and hierarchies must fall, which was a, a kind of more internal uh, protest against the, the hierarchical nature of the health sciences disciplines, where, um, you know, those of us with social science or humanities backgrounds were like, well, can you just do like, a, you know, a group discussion about racism and then it'll fix it. So there's there's often a kind of a desire for a, for a, for a, 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 like a, a fix to make it better as quickly as possible that is at odds with the kind of mechanisms of thinking about these complex spaces in social science or humanities ways. So yeah, so I suppose I'm just I, what what's been coming through to me is that there's so very many different layers and spaces in which we're talking about what social medicine is or could be. Thanks how to find space and support for an enduring engagement in a place that valorizes a quick fix. And I, I think that's something that all, all the presentations really spoke to. I want to give a moment for some um, other attendees um, to, to raise their questions. And so I, we have a question from Azania Hayward James and from Yi Cheng Wu. And I think Azania, I'm going to try and allow, allow you to talk. That's the button. I can ask you to unmute yourself if you want to jump in and ask your question. Absolutely. I'm honored to be the first community member to respond or ask a question. I am I am enamored by this conversation. Uh, at the same time, I'm troubled by, about the reality of the sentiment that has been expressed, because when you look at historically, you look at the ethnographic data, and I'm an African-American woman, when you look at the data, we have African-American women in particular, African-American population in general, uh, have been at the end of the spectrum in terms of health outcomes. A particular interest that I currently have is around Black maternal uh, mortality and health. And Black women are three times more likely to die, and it doesn't matter the economic st uh, status. My background is public health coming from CDC and HRSA, specifically with CDC working with the racial and ethnic approaches to community health. Some of the things that I saw in Flint before Flint became popular was that around environmental exposure and the high mortal, infant mortality rate that it was such likened to 
developing countries. See, the con the conversation may be uncomfortable, but when you live it, it's, it means life or death to someone like me. So I read, uh, what's the trade-off of making people feel uncomfortable with things that are actually a reality or working it out together? Because really there's a Swahili saying that says Pamoja Tutashinda, that means together we win. We can't get out of here unless we reconcile these. Uh, and I don't even like the word race because you, we, as we know in the learning world, race is a social construct. Ethnicity, yeah. When you look at the human being, 99.9 .9 cent, the same gene pool. So this conversation is, encourages me at the same time when I hear the reality because you know it's, it's uncomfortable feeling uncomfortable. When sitting in my pre-med class at Spelman College, Knowing about these things was uncomfortable, but it drove me more to work in this field and to work it out. And I still do that 30 years later. So I am excited about everything that everybody has said around the table. We have to put on our big boys and girls uh, panties, as my grandmother would say, or underpants, and we have to work it out. It's okay. Just like I put in the chat, um, Potty training is necessary. It's uncomfortable for the toddler. I have two, but it's necessary. So this is a growing pain. And I, I like to joke, that's my grandmother's um, gift she gave to me. But we are dying in every aspect of the word. And so it's an imperative. It's been a state of emergency for my community for decades. Let's go into centuries. So let's have the uncomfortable conversation with each other, holding each other's hand and work it out because it's necessary. Thanks for that, Azania. So well said. And I'm going to give the panel a moment to respond to that. But first, I want to let uh, Cheng Wu uh, jump in with their question as well. Uh, thank you. Can you hear my voice? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, I'm very excited to join the, 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 this workshop and I'm, I'm a psychiatrist and anthropologist in Taiwan and I'm part time teaching in uh, McKay Memorial. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm part time teaching in McKay uh, Medical School in Taiwan. And just a quick question is that, yes, today we talk about many things about structural competency, but what what is important is may be the structure of um, teaching faculties. I mean, that's my question is how you guys uh, survive in, in medical school because uh, we know we all know those social scientists that their, their research is really different to those big doctors. Uh, so um, is there any, um, I mean, that's what is your uh, system? I mean, is the, uh, um, promotion system friendly friendly enough for you guys and all and uh, is there any uh, guarantee quota um, in the the in, in your department for scientists uh, this is my a very quick and simple question thank you well thanks to both of you um uh, I'm opening this up to the panel I, I I see that you know Kenneth Nathan Barry all of your hands are up who wants to jump in first Sorry, I've opened up a question of a sort of a politeness. Okay. I can go if that's yeah. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, um, I've had I've had so many thoughts. So I'm I'm just gonna try to consolidate some of them. Um, I guess you know the 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 first one is uh, this question of like how do we deal with resistance and um, uh, the the discomfort and and um, Azina, thank you so much for your comment. I I everything you said um, kind of I think resonated with me about what um what what teaching about these topics what teaching about social justice and structural competency um like one of the things that it will raise uh, discomfort right and and that is actually one of um that's that actually is part of our pedagogy um of the course that both marco and i and i teach and and um you know and as marco said it beautifully part of of dealing with um that discomfort is to ask and to lean in into kind of the, the emotions that come up, either by foregrounding our, ourselves, right? Or also by, um, by making space, right? For students and learners to express that as actually going through, through that process. And um, I think as, as, as Kelly pointed out as well, like part of this is, you know, there are associations, right? For example, and I'm, I'm wondering if um, Barry can speak to this and say a little bit more, for example, about what happens, right? When you, sh you show a map 
uh, or the ne your neuro neuro neurological colleague showed a map of like <clears throat> the history of slavery and imposed it that upon the history of like the incidences or prevalence of stroke, right? Like when they came to you, did they ask what, <clears throat> what can we do, right? To kind of explain the connections between these two and why we, why did we did that versus for example, in some cases I've heard some of my colleagues here just, just leave that, right? And when you are a strength, right? As social scientists, right? Is to provide the framework for learners to make sense of that not only intellectually, but emotionally as well. And I think that is where um, we have like a lot of potential to, uh, to, to kind of offer the strength of, of a social scientific perspective. So that's my first point. My second point is, you know, part of this, it might be true that like some things we may have to think about a scale of, of how we do this to make things developmentally appropriate to different learners at different stages through medical school or residency but also of the developmentally appropriateness of, of a faculty who may be teaching this and they are at different stages as well. Um, and how do we kind of uh, think about that strategically? Um, and then I guess my third point um, is, is um, thank you so much for like highlighting like how it is that even people we th that the medical system may put as developmentally junior, right? Like residents or, <clears throat> or, or students may actually, as Helen pointed out, have some of the most innovative ideas. And in the social justice and health equity curriculum, that's built into the curriculum itself, where there are actually resident leaders, right? Who are uh, part of um, the people who do teach, develop the curriculum as part of the ped pedagogy and that it is, um, it is a transparent and also a, a democratic process of how do we come up with this material and how we also actually, in part of uh, social justice health and health equity, bring in community members, right? Um, and peer advocates as, as instructors. So just a few thoughts on that. Thanks so much. Um, maybe I can follow on some of Nathan's thoughts. Um, I, I uh, Azania's, uh, first comment in the chat used the word andragogy, which I didn't know, I'll, I'll confess, right? And so I'm, I'm realizing now that my references to pedagogy are infantilizing, right? Um, it's it's the, uh, the pediatric. And so I, I, I to, to Nathan's point, right, this and, and Helena's about um, uh, taking the experiences, affective, registers of our students very seriously and moving them and their insights um, directly into curricular spaces and um, being responsive and alert. Um, you, you sort of asked Nathan about the, um, the context of that uh, traumatizing stroke slide and yeah, there, there was constructive conversation, um, but uh, the, the bad andragogical move I made was I, I got impatient with early speculations uh, about stroke belt stuff um, around cortisol levels and it was just a little scientistic and I was impatient to get us to history and the social and so I turned to my slide deck and put that slide up and it was too sudden it wasn't predicated on student experiences or intuitions um, I should have been more patient about um, anyway so they're the same slide at a different point in the conversation, right? Or with more student voices in the mix could have played perfectly well. Um, so, um, yeah, I, the, the, the things that really struck me in terms of curricular um, efforts being made around the panel have to do with the um, pragmatic and community engaged work that several of you are doing. I'm, you know, in particular, Helena's and Kelly's, I, I, it just seems uh, so, remarkable to have students out in the community, outside the walls of the healthcare institution, um, interacting with community leaders and community members. Um, that's a really hard thing to shepherd and coordinate. Um, my, I have a question hinged to that, which is, um, wh what, what do you think about the two factors? I, I mean, one thing we share with you is that we're state institution. Right, um, and we we bear in our pedagogical ethos, our andragogical ethos, a a commitment to the the welfare of the state and the people of the state. There's also the you all occupy cityscape, and I'm just thinking about the wealth of um, 
resources that are around you and the intensity of the problems that are visible within, you know, small block radii, um, you know, um, here we have, we try to send students to people's homes, to interview them in homes, right? And, and students balk if we send them more than an hour away. Um, but, but we're a small, small city hospital in a um, suburban to rural, you know, catchment area. And um, anyway, it's a different, a different set of contexts. And I'm one, I'm just, I'm, I'm admiring your curricula on these fronts and trying to figure out how we can emulate that with the landscape we occupy and the resources we have. Thanks for that. I, I see um, three hands up and we're at seven o'clock, which is which is when we had, had told folks we'd be stopping, but let's let's get through these um, these these comments because I again this 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 engagement is, is what we're all here for. Uh, so we can at first uh, then then Kelly and then Carla and then we can work towards wrapping up. Uh, I'll just try to, to connect a few dots because I'm, I'm going back to a question that Jeremy asked at the beginning about the commonalities that what, what defines social medicine. And I, I was reminded of something that uh, Ian Hacking wrote in another context about the, the whole discussion about social construction has a, a fantastic book called The Social Construction of What. And that, that also ties into the whole discussion about STS, Barry. Uh, and he says that, that all the different approaches to social construction is that they are uh, iconoclastic. They are against the status quo. So uh, first of all, we, we, wanting or not, we are going to play the role of get flies. And this is bound to be uncomfortable sometimes. But on the other hand, if you think about the medical profession, it, you're choosing to deal with human suffering on a daily basis for the rest of your life. So it's unavoidable to be uncomfortable. We, we have, I mean, uh, we want, I, I don't think we should provoke students to feel bad uh, deliberately, but I think the, the alternative to that is to provide support for the inevitable situations when this kind of thing is, is bound to happen. And uh, unfortunately, in our case, it's very hard to offer some practical perspectives because of the opportunity of where we are situated in the, the medical course. As I, I said before, it's a, they are in a very theoretical back area of, of the general uh, education, but our colleagues from the family health program do have this kind of initiative. And I think it's very important for the students. I don't know to what extent, the, 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 the whole challenge that we have is how much what we do being confined to a minority of the time that they spend in the curriculum will affect how they will behave later on as medical professions, professionals. And, and, and that's the, the challenge that we have. But I, I mean, we can only, only offer a space to reflect, to provoke, uh, to try to challenge the conceptions that we have and hope for the best. Um, and nothing else shared. And in the case of the family health programs, they do take people to visit uh, they work with, uh, we, have a, we have a family health program uh, that covers most of the population here in, in Brazil and here in Rio in, in very poor areas in the favelas. One of those is connected to the uh, medical program in, in our university. So the students go there, they make uh, house visits and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I'd hope that this kind of reality shock will make them very uncomfortable on the one hand and change their outlook on, on how the profession should be uh, exerted. That's it. Thanks for that, Ken. Um, Kelly? Yeah, just really quick. I, thank you, Barry, for those kind words. I'm really excited about the Community Grand Rounds program, which is the slide that I shared that, that came out of a you know, a, a long process of collaboration um, uh, between uh, di multiple community organizations that all work in one neighborhood in the Tenderloin and UCSF. But I wanna say that um, the overall community, as I put on the slide of gaps and challenges, the overall community engagement um, curriculum is really lacking and needs a lot of work. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna mis misrepresent um, how well things are going at UCSF. I think that there's a lot of room there, but I think the community grand rounds um, is a, is a good model and mostly because it's really taught the UCSF faculty uh, and students how to get out of the way um, and really let it be community driven and community led and how to support the, the, the as I said in the slide, the flip of the expertise um, and the pedagogy. Um, and I think that's really that's really what's been successful there. Um, and it you know it takes time and relationship building that that's you know been happening for me over 25 years. Um, 
And that's really critical. Even urban rural setting, I, I, I totally hear that, but it's also just that trust building when you've had uh, when you've had uh, so many um, negative institutional experiences on the community part. And our department is also working on a um, program of uh, historic um, reconciliation for medical harm. Um, that's a, that's a, a partner project in history um, uh, with the repair project and other efforts to, act, to have an open and transparent community dialogue about that, which is really critically desired and I think needs to undergird any, any movement toward action on community engagement. Thanks so much, Kelly. And Carla, we turn to you. Uh, thanks, Barry. Also picking up on your point, so we have a kind of mixed approach to community context. We have site facilitators and site coordinators based at either primary health care or uh, community health care facilities or at hospitals of varying sizes, so from the tertiary hospitals all the way down to kind of first level hospitals. Um, and students at a certain point get sent from the different disciplines to engage in those spaces. And, and interact with communities and there are things like home visits. So I think, um, you know, kind of there, there's some overlap in the, in the kind of approaches to healthcare in, in, you know, in Rio and in Cape Town. But they also, that does also come with, with a kind of quite complex discussions. And it's interesting when you speak to people who've trained, for example, as social workers or other disciplines where a lot of the, the, the central core of the learning is about, you know, humility with which you go in that there can be a, a somebody mentioned what was it the 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 I think Helena it was your comment about sorry it's one it's it's one o'clock in the morning here my brain is not where it should be um Helena your comment around um you know people having a needing some humility and and often you have the the downside or the complexities of sending particularly younger, perhaps not as experienced or not as conscious of their privileged health sciences students into context is that there can also be a lot of damage um, because of an assumption that, well, I'll just go in and fix this thing, you know, and, and, and Kelly goes back to this, there's not always a, a full recognition of what it means to actually listen to a community who knows what's going on in their own backyard. So that's a complexity that, that's constantly under discussion. But there is a big discussion at the moment here around, do we completely remove the teaching platforms outside of the urban tertiary hospitals and start thinking about teaching in rural peri-urban contexts? So completely, it, it's, it's coming up as, a, as quite a serious discussion. Like, do we just invert the entire way in which a lot of the teaching in cities has been done? Um, away from tertiary hospitals and into different corridors of area where there's more need. So I'm not sure where that's going to go, but it's kind of a very interesting, it's a very interesting development. And, and it, it, yeah, as I say, it very it does come with, yeah, with all sorts of complexities. Well, thank you for that, Carla. And I, I love the way you're sketching this out at the end, right? This is kind of reminds me of what, uh, you know, Hoffman Mahler is the director general of the World Health Organization when asked what to do to best improve the world's health would be to close all of the medical schools for a few years um, and then just kind of, you know, basically build them again from the ground up. And it's that kind of bold vision that is necessary in this kind of a conversation and in some ways reflects the audacity of trying to put a conversation about, you know, global social medicine um, within three hours even, right? It's a luxury for all of us to just take three hours to have one conversation but this conversation requires a few days or a few years or really ongoing commitment. Um, I have so many um, questions and so many thoughts that come from listening to you. I, I, but I wanna really right now just thank all of you um, because I think one of the things to, to, to note here is that all of the panelists come from places in which social medicine, however we're defining it, but generally this close engagement of um, you know, rich academic areas of social sciences and humanities engagements with medical training, right, um, is, is supported robustly, I think, all of you. And yet still all of us, and I think most poignantly captured in, in I think, in, in Barry's conversation at the end, but then also in, even in David's conversation in the beginning, even in these very robustly supported institutions, it's still threatened and challenging and requires retranslation on a constant basis, even though no dean of any medical school in the world that I know of would attempt to say that medicine is a purely biological trade, right? So that while the social is always acknowledged, the deep engagement and the messiness and the long commitments 
and the community involvement and the radical rethinking of a lot of things that are held taken for granted in biomedicine, like these are constantly um, things we, we need to fight for as folks in prior generations have as well. I would like to propose that there are many things that will continue to come out of this conversation. I mean, in many ways, this is a concluding conversation of a five-year project that's been supported by the Wellcome Trust and Global Social Medicine, but the necessity of this network is still present. I know that Junko Kitanaka has circulated a Google documents to house some of the materials from this. Um, I would love to think that many different collaborations can continue to grow, especially as we think of how can the challenges that we all face in our respective well-resourced institutions um, be shared with institutions of medical training or other health training where social medicine is not an identifiable feature of the landscape. So how, how might we, moving forward, create some articulated vision of the necessity and urgency of this material and scalable and shareable ways of teaching it that could actually help this take root in, in more institutions as well? And that's a question not to answer now, but just to leave floating as we thank all of you. We particularly thank um, Ethel Rojas and Emma Levrau for bringing us all together I want to note it was really the perspicacity of Junko Kitanaka that made this event happen in the first place, um, as well as really each of you for taking part and sharing your experience. So thanks again. I will applaud you all. I can't find my applause emoji right now. Um, and uh, thanks. Just, thanks, Jeremy. Can I just add? Um, I, I really like to thank um, Emma and FL for all, all their um, help again. And also just want to mention that we have collected all the materials in the Google Drive, but it's actually shared only by the speakers at this point. So if it, it really should be open to anybody with a link, then I can change the setting. But I haven't gotten the uh, consent from all the uh, participants. So what, what to do? Do you want to make it public or? I'd say let's, um, so as to not to put anyone on the spot right now, let's circulate this as an email. And I'm sure some of the people here would be comfortable making it public, but perhaps not all. And so that way we, we can sh we can guarantee some form of public link of at least some of the materials. Okay. Does that sound like a fair? Yes, so anybody who's listening, who's interested in looking at those slides, uh, perhaps you can email me and I can see what I can do. Thanks very much. That will be great and more equitable. And I understand with research, you know, there's proprieties and all those kind of things. But for the community side and being a public health professional, th this is really groundbreaking work. And I would really like to be able to actually look at it in more detail than just on this call for an hour or so. Sure thing. All right. Well, thank you again. Thanks again to everybody for taking part and for all who, who's, who's, who stuck with us for this time. And uh, you know, here's to this conversation moving forward in many different venues.